Growing up relatively poor meant watching your more affluent friends go to fantastical, far-flung places for their family holidays while you got to go to the discount equivalent. Disneyland Paris? Well, we can't afford that. But Blackpool Tower is pretty neat, right? And hey, at least there aren't any French people around. Lest you think I was about to compare Rings of Power to a coupon holiday, no, actually. I had a lot of fun on those discount trips. Much more fun than I had when I eventually went to Disneyland itself. There's an honesty and a character to cheap holidays. Gaudy, big-budget tourist mega-magnets, though, well, they're always at least a little bit soulless. Sure, they've got the production value, the costumes are great, the rides look impressive, but there is a desperation behind that Mickey Mouse costume, the kind of desperation that leads to, well, wearing a Mickey Mouse costume and prostituting yourself for children's entertainment. For legal reasons, no other link between Disney and prostituting children will here be drawn. Rings of Power is a Disneyland production. Glitzy, glamorous, ingloriously expensive, almost entirely meaningless. You see more characters than you would in a cheaper production, but far fewer real people, far less personality. It's entertainment as distraction, not entertainment as foundation, education, or edification. For all the money spent on it, there is far more richness to be found in a second-hand copy of The Fellowship of the Ring you can pick up for a couple of quid from, uh, well, Amazon, inevitably. But back to Disneyland we go for episode 3 of Rings of Power. The only thing I have left to say to round off this introduction is thanks to those of you who have responded to the call to arms at the close of that previous video. I've had a few of you email and a few get in touch via Twitter. Apologies to those I've not got around to responding to yet. I'll have a little bit more to say about this and specifically addressing where we go next at the close of this video. But I guess that means we can get right on with the show. Don't worry, no long and tortuous analogies comparing Jeff Bezos to Satan in this one, and I'll try and spread the lore stuff out a little bit more evenly too. Though there will be some lore where the show is referencing or borrowing from it or otherwise egregiously wiping shit all over it, the main thrust of this video and this series of videos going forward is to critique the show's writing. Because, though the common argument deployed by Rings of Power defenders is that people who cite lawbreaks are just angry nerds and the show is actually good if you forget the fact that it's claiming to be an adaptation, the reality is that the show is just as bad on its own terms as it is as an adaptation. It's not just the law that it's defiling, it's the most basic standards of writing. People who claim the show is good on its own terms are so tasteless they should test themselves for COVID immediately or else check their medical records to see if they've been lobotomized. We left episode 2 in about 50,000 places at once. Don Lemon has been nagged by some tunnel goblins. His beard and her kid with the evil sword and his hatred for flaws have gone off to find refuge in the elves' watchtower. Steve, not Gandalf, has just genocided some fireflies in a bid to persuade Brandy to raid Lenny Henry's library of Starbucks. Young Ned Stark has just presented his case at Khazad Doom, leaving Harry and Meghan to try and persuade King Charles to show the elves what's inside Marcellus Wallace's briefcase and help them with their construction projects. Celebrimbor, having walked for several days or teleported instantly to get to Khazad Doom, has presumably walked or teleported back from whence he came. And Mighty Morphid Power Elf, along with probably Evil Hunk, have survived the attack of Cthulhu's gay fish and been discovered floating adrift by a passing glob of semen. Is that it? Have I missed anything? I know the episode hasn't started yet, but I'm obliged to point out already that we have a massive problem with the narrative here. As I said in the previous video, Rings of Power has presented us with a superabundance of people, but a severe deficit of characters, all spread so far apart in geography and screen time that A, none of them, with the arguable exceptions of Brandy and Prince Harry, have actually developed anything approaching a personality yet, B, lacking that personality, it's not been possible to invest more than a dime in any of them, and C, what passes for the plot of this show has already been largely killed off by a thousand snippets of loosely connected subplot, with the effect being that it feels tedious for large stretches and still manages to feel rushed in its important bits. It feels thin, like butter spread over too much bread. Were I tasked with rewriting those first two episodes, I'd have introduced maybe half of these characters in episode one, and spent a good deal more time with each of them, establishing enough of their personalities and stories and relevance to the world as to make them both memorable and intriguing, and then left them entirely for episode 2, there to take the same approach with the remaining cast. I'd also not have made Mighty Morphid Power Elf, the show's lead, a frigid, overpowered, cold and uninteresting bitch, and I might perhaps have given her something vaguely resembling a character. 
In fact, I'd probably not have made her the lead to begin with. After all, she can't die. Even this show's writers wouldn't dick about with the law to that extent. She's also far too old at this point in history for her character and personality to be as immature as it's presented as being. And hell, if we're doing extensive rewrites, I'd not have tried to condense thousands of years of history from the darkening of Valinor to the fall of Numenor into the first season, a creative decision that more or less guarantees we are incapable of inhabiting any one place or forming any attachments to it before it is unceremoniously drowned by the sea. There is so much story you could have packed into that time span even if you are just making shit up. But as I was so often obliged to point out in the last video, writing is hard. But on with episode 3. We kick off with Don Lemon as a slave, having been captured in the deep dark tunnels while hunting for his journalistic reputation in the previous episode. You'll recall that in that episode, Don Lemon was used to commit the show's first injection of modern race politics, when angry young white guy asked when black people, I mean elves, but now nah, they really meant black people, were going to stop clinging onto the past, blaming white men's ancestors for historic wrongs and threatening the return of Donald Trump, I mean the true king, to liberate whitey from the tyranny of the minorities, I mean elves. I don't intend to go back over why that kind of blunt political allegory is such a massive betrayal of Tolkien and of his works. If you're interested, see the previous video. But the inevitable problem is that once a show has committed this sin, you end up expecting it to do so again and again and again. You go looking for allegories. Sometimes you find them where they do not exist. Sometimes you find them where they do. Placing our first elf of color. Do we have an official acronym for that, by the way? Is it too late to suggest EFOC? L fuck. Anyway, placing our first L fuck in chains automatically raises some big red flags, though this will come across as artfully subtle compared to what we get later, but we'll come to that presently. For now, there is some more mundane stupidity to address, and in fact, there's quite a lot of mundane stupidity to address. In the first place, the elves have been enslaved by a mob of orcs, and here there is a selection of questions and problems. Firstly, that they should have captured Don Lemon is explicable. He made the mistake of going spelunking in search of his reputation in that last episode, but how did they come to capture so many other elves, including those from the watchtower Don Lemon was stationed in? The elves are the predominant military force in this region. They have watchtowers for a reason. Did the orcs tunnel right up from under the tower and filch them in the night? Given Don Lemon and Nameless Wench just stumbled across the burned out village in the last episode, and so the orcs tunnel, why didn't the elves in the tower or a nearby tower spot this buildup of evil? Have we just forgotten the elves are incredibly far-sighted because that would be inconvenient to the plot? I very much fear we have. In the second place, given the orcs have already apparently dug an extensive tunnel network of their own, why are they here forcing the elves to dig an extension for them? In the third place, why the fuck are they forcing the elves to build an extension in broad daylight while the rest of the tunnel network was firmly and sensibly underground? The orcs have been digging tunnels because they hate the sunlight. We'll come back to that in a moment as well. But they have a large group of prisoners. The prisoners are in the sunlight. That's where they're working. The orcs have to cower under their tents while the elves work. As prisons go, this is hardly fucking cold it's. Your guards can't actually approach you without suffering great pain and inconvenience. There are a lot of you. You're armed with tools, shovels, axes and such. The elves are incredibly nimble and light-footed, as we will also see later. They have everything they need to escape, an ample opportunity to escape, and the orcs are uniquely incapable of stopping that escape. Why, given they cannot go out in the sunlight, would not the orcs have kept the elves locked up during the day and forced them to dig at night? And that's granting the orcs needed the elves to dig for them in the first place, which the last episode seemed to suggest that they didn't. This entire setup is completely fucking ridiculous, but it needs to happen, I guess, because the plot demands it be so. So the episode has begun on a massive great contrivance. Not a promising start. No worries though, I'm sure it will get much worse than this. And given the next shot sees Mighty Morphid Power Elf waking up aboard the ship from the last episode, I think it's safe to say it is already worse. Hunk is already up and gives her some food, which she doesn't have time to eat, because they're interrupted and brought up on deck to meet... Ocean Man. These are men of Numenor, the island kingdom created in the lore by the Valar, as a reward for men's exploits. Something else I'm sure we'll come back to. For now though, 
and though it might seem improbable to do it at this juncture, I want to touch on the race question that I teased in the previous video but that I didn't have time to go into then. Because the existence of Numenor and the Numenorians invites you to look through a window into a world where people could handle these things sensibly. I said in that previous video that Meghan Markle, uh, I mean Deesa, the dwarven princess played by Sophia Nomvitz, Nomvetsi, one of those, actually proved to be one of the better, more personable, and more characterful of the show's creations. I know a few others who were at least pleasantly surprised by her as well. But the show has a problem with race and it has a problem with place and the interrelationship between the two. I apologize for breaking so quickly from the plot of the show, but I do think this bit is important to address given so much has been said about it. The plot, after all, has to take place somewhere, and in creating believable worlds, it's important to understand what somewhere actually is. Because the vast majority of modern script writers and showrunners come from an incredibly small clique of people, and they all live in big cities, they don't really have a conception of what differentiates places and their peoples. Their idea of diversity is what they see all around them, a vast multicultural sea of humanity, everyone from anywhere mixing everywhere they look. To the extent they travel abroad, they will usually travel to tourist hotspots and other big cities rather than to anywhere truly representative of that host nation. So-called citizens of the world actually know very little about the world because everywhere they go resembles the international city, and the international city has throughout history been defined against the character of the rest of the country in which it's placed. This is one of the many reasons revolting English peasants frequently took their pitchforks to London, and rightly so. This kind of hyperdiversity is what these writers know, but it is not, to reclaim one of the words they've stolen, representative. Even in their own Western countries, and certainly elsewhere in less developed parts of the world, what marks a place out is, amongst other things, its relative homogeneity. I have a houseboat in London, but I spend rather more time these days back in the village I grew up in. Amongst its handful of defining features is the fact that the population is, almost without exception, white and aging but that's another matter. It's one of the things that separates this village from London, that separates it in unstated and unremarkable but quite definite ways that you would notice were it not so. It's what gives these places discrete characters. This isn't to say that one is better or worse than the other, but it is to say that they are profoundly different, and the makeup of their peoples, and so the makeup of their cultures, marks them as such. My village is not an isolated case. Or rather, its isolation is general, this is what defines rural areas in large part, and rural areas make up the bulk of the country. The kind of racial and colour mixing you see in London and other big cities in the UK and the US is simply not operative on the same scale in the majority of either nation. Even within big cities, ethnic groups tend to cluster together. Emigrants from one country move in clusters and immigrate largely to the same regions of their new homes. This has always and everywhere been the case. Cities are seldom representative of national patterns, they are always outliers in terms of their population mix, but even within cities you see ethnic groups clustering. Gold is green in London, for example, is disproportionately Jewish. Tower Hamlets is disproportionately Bangladeshi. In the US, Minneapolis has an outsized Sudanese population, which is largely responsible for the continued and regretful existence of Ilhan Omar. And so it goes. I mention all this because villages, towns, and city districts all have distinctive character that tells you where you are and that marks those places out from their neighbors. Racial or ethnic conglomeration is one significant part of that. Game of Thrones, which was an incredibly diverse show, understood this point. To a lesser extent, because it was restricted by its narrative, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films did as well. Part of the reason these worlds felt so well realized on screen is that you had immediate visual clues provided by the population separating Dawn from Winterfell in the first instance and the Shire from Bree in the second, for example. But this is now a rare approach. Rings of Power, like Wheel of Time before it, has taken another and less effective one. This is partly because the writers have no real experience of those places in the real world that should serve as inspiration for their creations in the fictional world. But it's also because the point of diversity and representation, as we've come to understand it today, is not to reflect the real diversity of the real world, as they claim it is, but rather a select group of people's ideals of what diversity should be. The irony of those saying that fantasy should resemble the real world is that their fantasy depictions much less resemble the real world than the older iterations they criticize for their perceived whiteness, amongst other reasons. The Jackson film's clear delineation of a homogenous and isolated shire and a suavely, definitely foreign band of Easterlings 
is a much closer approximation of the real world's divides than Rings of Powers' attempts to claim the most isolated group of not hobbits should have a racial mix akin to Chicago. Again, the differences between true diversity, which must include accurate group formation, and a small group of people's idealized and politicized idea of the point and desirability of a different type of diversity. These two facts combine to explain why people have become so pissed off with the peddlers of this latter approach and wary whenever they see minority actors cast in certain roles. It is not, as Amazon would like you to believe, that there is a toxic group of fans that just hates diversity wherever they see it. No, it fucking isn't. A useful counterexample here would be Cordis Valerian in House of the Dragon. His casting did raise some eyebrows. It wasn't helped when he gave, to my knowledge, the only interview of the white people can't stand to see black people in fantasy type. People looked at that casting, remembered what has been pushed on them by activists for far too long, and how they've been slandered by those same activists and the studios they back, weighed the casting decision against what they knew of the world the show was set in, and concluded preemptively that this was likely to be another example of pushing diversity at the expense of realism and adherence to the law. But House of the Dragon has gone on to become very popular, and those complaints have all but disappeared. There isn't much of an argument anymore about the pushing of race and diversity in House of the Dragon, because the show was written well enough to make that casting fit its world. It's explicable in-universe, and it's not being used as propaganda out-universe. Cordis Valerian has come to seem a natural enough part of a well-written story. And, as ever and always, Arcane's deserved success is proof that the audience would adore an incredibly diverse cast if that cast fits the world it's set in, if it's well-realized, and if it's not used to push political points. I've not seen it yet, but I gather Cyberpunk Edgerunners is seeing a similar effect. I raise the issue now because Rings of Power had an opportunity to do exactly the same thing. It's a vast world of many regions populated by many peoples, bigger even than that of Game of Thrones or House of the Dragon. By virtue of the type of story the show is trying to tell, we have, or we should have, ample opportunity to explore these different regions and peoples. There's a way to achieve realistic representation that accords with the known laws of both universes, ours and the show's. And the arrival of the Numenorians is an example of how the show almost took this simple and popular approach, but then ditched it in favor of the other less believable and less popular one. The Numenorians are an island people. In the lore at any rate, they are drawn from those men who stood against Morgoth, given the island by the Valar as reward for their struggles. You would expect to see a degree of diversity at its inception, but that also happened a very long time ago indeed. The men who stood against Morgoth were not all the men of Middle-earth from all places in Middle-earth where men might be found. They were drawn from specific regions. The men of the Southlands, for example, largely sided with Morgoth. The show had an opportunity to represent the kind of group-denominated diversity you would expect to see given that history. For example, you could have cast a whole host of Hispanic actors by geography rather than specific nation and ethnicity to populate Numenor. You would then have represented, if you insist on doing that, a whole swathe of the real world in your fictional one, clearly delineating the men of Numenor from the men of the Southlands, like Halbrand, which after all will go on to become Mordor. Mordor is bordered by places like Cand and Harad, described in the lore as being swarthy with dark hair and eyes, dark skin generally darker still in Farharad. Given how much of Rings of Power is focused in this region, and how many of its key characters on screen hail from there, including several main characters, you could have cast Black and North African actors to play them. The Harfoots, by contrast, and especially the Elves and Dwarves, have closer analogues in the peoples of Northern and Northwestern Europe. Taking this approach, you'd have accomplished everything you could possibly want to achieve if you were minded toward believable and story-relevant diversity. Large numbers of the principal cast portrayed by actors of different backgrounds, including underrepresented groups like North Africans and Hispanics. A true range of diverse peoples given prominent roles, and a world that is automatically more genuinely and naturally varied in its diversity than the pick-and-mix approach much modern media takes which seems to think there's really no genuine demographic difference between an isolated tribe of not-hobbits, the Numenorians, the Elves, the Dwarves, and the Men of the Southlands. Instead, in the ship's crew of Numenor, which is our first introduction to them, what we get is pretty much the typical city-minded smorgasbord of backgrounds. And though not fatally, it nonetheless makes Numenor itself much less contained, much less clearly delineated from any other group of peoples, and much more loosely defined conceptually. This problem much more significantly undermines the depiction of the not-hobbits, of course, 
and then to a lesser extent the dwarves and the elves as well. Bear in mind what we know of the not hobbits and later the actual hobbits in The Lord of the Rings. They are a small, highly insular population that deliberately shirks contact with the wider world. They fear, distrust, and are overwhelmed by the wider world. What they absolutely do not do, as a matter of habit and culture, is mix with the wider world. This is what gives the Shire its definition. This is what makes it an entity in its own right and also one that's familiar to the great proportion of the audience that has visited or that lives in similarly isolated and homogenous places given character and color by an autochthonous population. If you decide, by contrast, to give the Shire the demography of Islington, that effect is entirely lost and the world becomes that much less believable as a result. We can make similar points in similar ways with the elves and actually create opportunities for even more diversity, not less. The elves are, after all, not one people. They begin as such in the Silmarillion at the point of their creation when they are one people, the Quendi. But as time goes on, they split apart, culturally and geographically, and so it's not too much of a stretch of the imagination to say ethnically as well. Early in the Silmarillion, the elves are summoned to Valinor, but not all of them go. This is what's known as the Sundering of the Elves, when you get the emergence of distinct groups, the Noldor, the Teleri, the Vanyar, and then those that remain behind in Middle-earth further split, some of the Teleri becoming the Nandor, for example, and some the Sindar, as they spread out over Middle-earth and form their own kingdoms and cultures. At the point Rings of Power is seemingly set, centuries if not millennia have passed since all of this happened. This then gives the show the opportunity to do natural diversity, even more of it, more diversity, which I wouldn't be opposed to and I don't think many fans would be either. You'd still find some people complaining that the elves were described as being fair universally, but you'd greatly diminish the force and validity of that criticism if you made the rest of the diversity part of the world building. Have black elves if you really think you need to, but then all elves of their region and faction should be black. Because, like but to a lesser extent than the not hobbits, the elves are not big mixers. They don't breed rapidly, they don't cross communities all that readily. Yep, the existence of black elves might still have irked purists, but again, Cordis Valerian's reception and the quick dying of opposition to him proves that even law-minded fans are prepared to forgive and forget this kind of thing if the world building is honest, apolitical, non-allegorical, sensible, consistent, and faithful to the fundamentals of its source material. That said, if you were to take the approach I've just set out, you wouldn't need to have black elves because you could have cast a number of your main characters from the Southlands as black or dark-skinned anyway. That too would get around the very thorny question of cultural appropriation that arises when you see traditionally white characters from traditionally white cultures recast as other races in ways that would not be accepted today were it to happen, as it once did, the other way around. It's simply a myth to say, as some on both sides of the argument have attempted to say, that Tolkien's world was always and uniformly white. It wasn't. The existence of the Easterlings refutes that notion. It was vast and embracing in its scope but it was also written with a mind to realism. Its peoples were naturally formed and naturally placed and not blended to the point where there is no difference between them. Anyway, I think the approach I've just set out would be called a compromise. This is, I would argue, a principled objection not to diversity per se, but to the manner and purpose of diversity as we are seeing it in Rings of Power. The question isn't, can black people exist in Middle-earth? Of course they can. The question is, accepting that they can, in what manner do you include them and where? In what manner do you include any race and where? How do you blend diversity and realism? Should representation be realistic or defined by the idealism of activist writers against that realism? I've just given you my answer. I think it's fairly well supported, but the overarching point to bear in mind is that it should be possible to ask these questions and make these arguments and look at least for compromise solutions without branding half your audience or the other half of the fandom, bigots and racists because they don't conform to your political and ideological idea of capital D diversity. You're welcome to refute my suggestion if you want to. Argue with me in the comments if you like. I welcome it. But otherwise, I don't see the problem with having these conversations. These conversations are good and proper. They are integral to world building. And all these best conversations are integral to story. These are not simply political matters. They are artistic matters as well. Questions of artistic integrity are indeed at stake. But nah. Instead, and coming back to the show as it's presented to us, in our first glimpse of the uh, seamen on the new Minorian ship, we get the full smorgasbord of modern metropolitan life and so, well, there goes part of your world building, there goes your natural diversity. We've gotta tick those boxes. And if you don't like these boxes being ticked, you are probably a racist. Ain't modern fandom wonderful? Anyway, we're introduced to probably the show's only reliable actor, 
here playing Ocean Man, otherwise known as Elendil, father of Isildur. We will see Isildur himself shortly as well. Though it's worth pointing out here that were the show faithfully adapting even that material that it has the rights to, Elendil and Isildur shouldn't actually be around for another, I don't know, 2,000 years or so? Or at least for a couple of seasons of the show. Elendil isn't born until after the forging of the rings by Celebrimbor, if memory serves, and he hasn't forged them yet. Elendil and Isildur don't have large parts to play until the fall of Numenor under Sauron's corrupting influence, which happens centuries after the forging of the rings. Now, I don't mention all this just to point out the contradictions with the lore. The first video established that the show isn't set in the universe Tolkien created. We don't need to go into too much detail to emphasize that point again. I was lucky enough to be on EFAP just recently, and the approach they take is to try and restrict themselves to plot and the show on its own terms rather than critiquing it because it was done better elsewhere, and I agree with that approach. But paradoxically, that's why it's occasionally necessary to cite further lore contradictions. Sometimes the show is borrowing lore events that are contingent on preceding events that the show has scrapped or been unable to use, which we'll encounter often across these videos. In other places, it's squeezing the law together in unnecessary and unwise ways. And this makes reference to the law from time to time useful in exposing problems that are the sui generis nature of Rings of Power. This condensing is one such example. Rings of Power is supposed to run for, what, I think it's five seasons? It has time to build toward momentous events, and it needs a stock of momentous events to drop across this five season run. But rather than be patient, Rather than spread the things out, it seems to be rushing to several conclusions at once. Sauron's return, the forging of the rings, the Numenorean invasion of Middle-earth, the fall of Numenor, Sauron's eventual triumph. Not only does cramming these things in deprive subsequent seasons of brilliant material they might otherwise have had more time to use, it means a. that each event is diminished by its proximity to the others, b. that they are further diminished by how quickly we are leading up to them, and C, we're never actually given any time to invest in the people and places in question because the show, despite being boring and empty for large portions of each episode, still cannot allow us the time to come to know them, to understand them, or to feel anything about them at all. Anyway, as I say, Ocean Man is perhaps the only reliable actor in the show, but the dialogue is as unreliable or as reliably shit as ever. He begins by telling Mighty Morphid Power Elf and Hunk that he won't answer their questions, but that he'll take them to his superiors, who will. He then proceeds to half answer two questions in quick succession, so I'm glad to see we've already begun looking at consistency as the enemy. More seriously, and this will become apparent later, this gives us the firmest hint we've really received yet as to precisely when in time this part of the show is set. We are in mid to late stage Numenor, meaning things are about to go very badly wrong for the world albeit they will also go very badly wrong for the show because of the way it's discarded the setup, as we will shortly see. Ocean Man has Mighty Morphid Power Elf's dagger, which she wants back, but for now, we get our first glimpse of Numenor on screen. And, well, let's be balanced, there is good and there is bad. Of the bad, there are technical challenges with boat scenes set against green-screened backdrops, because unless you have the set that can mimic the subtle, natural movements of the boat on the water, it increases the uncanny valley effect of the green screen. I've spent much of the last few years of my life living on boats, and let me tell you, even the big ones move about. Small ones move about more, of course, for reasons of physics, but even the big ones move, however subtly it might seem. When, however, you're green screening a backdrop and your set is static, things don't quite look right. Everything is too still. The bow line doesn't move at all in relation to the backdrop, meaning the entire ship, which is supposed to be bobbing about at least a little bit, well, it just feels too still. It's a subtler form of the moving car back projection problem in old movies. You know, where the car itself is actually static, but the guy holding the wheel moves it as though he were steering, and the windows are actually footage of moving scenery. It jars because the little things don't add up. The guy moving the wheel isn't doing so according with what we see through the window. He might be turning left on a straight road, or he's driving straight on a tight bend something my mum actually does in real life quite often, hence the number of cars and pedestrians she's written off. This has the same jarring quality to it. The bow line against the passing cliffs is absolutely still. It looks like scenery sliding past a set, not a boat floating past scenery. The other problem is really double-edged. Numenor in the lore is spectacular. It's powerful, advanced, rich beyond dreams, massive in size and in scale. There is an invitation for the show to do what it really wants to do, which is to impress you with its visuals, and it is impressive, wherever it isn't uncanny. 
I mentioned one problem with CGI Megascapes in the previous video, but the other is a problem of contrast. If you've gone to the time and effort of making intimate practical sets, the difference in texture, tone and lighting between those and their CGI vistas and establishing shots is stark and not in a good way. In The Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson got around this problem by intelligently blending practical and computer-generated effects. An awful lot of the backdrops weren't actually CGI, they were painted. Often, scale models would be built, either completely or displaying the relevant part of the building intended for the shot. The backdrop would then be painted, the remainder of the building would be filled in digitally, and they did this with a number of the shots of Orthanc, the tower at Isengard, for example. And this blend smooths out the differences that would otherwise be starkly apparent between the practical and digital shots. Rings of Power hasn't been anything like so intelligent. It quite often pairs entirely practical sets, the top deck of the ship for example, with entirely digital vistas following immediately, and that actually invites us to notice the differences rather than encouraging us to overlook them. When enough time has passed since the last practical shot that you can forget about the difference, the digital panorama of Numenor does convey its size and its grandeur, albeit to really enjoy it you kind of have to pretend you're watching a video game cutscene because the lighting and the textures just aren't anything like as photorealistic at all. The approach to Numenor then is kind of impressive, but you are frequently distracted, not least by a statue of one of the precursor guys from Prometheus, and otherwise by quick jumps between shots that are so different in nature that you might as well be watching entirely separate productions. Which, after a fashion, you are. Since the Numenor approach is a big set piece, and big set pieces are successful or otherwise, based on a number of different technical elements, I guess now would be a good time as well to mention the score again. I said in the last video that Bear McCreary had at times managed to capture the overall orchestral composition and so the general sound of Howard Shaw's soundtrack, but that the soundtrack itself was seldom noticeable and just not integral to the show, as Shaw's work was for The Lord of the Rings. Now I quite like Bear McCreary. He's been a superb television composer. He's honed his talent working to strict budgets and that's forced him to be very creative. See the soundtrack to Battlestar Galactica, where the budget was so small he had to make do with a few drums and a doodook. He's been getting bigger projects since, and I believe he's been learning under John Williams recently, and you can hear that creeping into his score for this show, largely because of the way he deploys his, um, uh, his horn. I mean his horns, French horns, obviously. Williams has a very pronounced fondness for the horn, and utilizes them in ways Howard Shaw doesn't meaning McCreary's occasional deployment of them in Rings of Power soundtrack does sometimes sound, albeit not for more than a few seconds at a time, slightly John Williams-y. What marks Williams and Shaw out from most other composers, however, is their use of the leitmotif. The leitmotif is an idea popularized by Wagner for his ring cycle, but you can trace it back to Monteverdi and other earlier composers as well. In short, it's a musical phrase or tune that accompanies a character, a place, or a mood and the best and most memorable soundtracks are those with the best and most memorable deployments of the leitmotif. Most film composers have a very basic understanding of it that really amounts to little more than a character tune. That guy's on screen, so that track plays. What makes for brilliant operatic and film composition is a more subtle and flexible understanding. Yes, characters and places have themes, but the motif should shift and fluctuate depending on the mood, on the meaning of a scene, and in a sense based on what the world itself thinks of the characters in any given time. The Lord of the Rings is a sublime example of the leitmotif done right. It's what makes its soundtrack so memorable. The basic tune of Shaw's motif for Rohan, Gondor, Isengard and the Shire might be simple, the core of any good leitmotif tends to be because it's the tune that we remember, but the deployment of it is complex and nuanced. For example, when we first encounter Edoras and Rohan, it's at a civilizational low point. Theoden is possessed by Saruman and corrupted by Grima. The nation itself is fraying, as we see visually represented by the torn flag that greets Aragorn, Legolas, Gandalf and Gimli on their arrival there. But it's also represented by the score. The Rohan motif plays for the first time, but it's weak, it's thin and tremulous, that's designed to convey weakness, fragility and sadness. The theme itself doesn't shift across either of the two films in which it features, The Two Towers and Return of the King, but the variations on it are starkly different. Bigger, grander and more fulsome instrumentation greets Theoden's revival after Gandalf breaks Saruman's spell. A somber, foreboding, noble yet tense variation plays when the Rohirrim arrive to meet Sauron's armies on the Pelennor fields in Return of the King. This is the same tune, it's the same motif, it's what makes it instantly recognizable. 
but it's being deployed in vastly different ways to produce and to portray vastly different emotions. The feebleness of Theoden under Saruman's influence, its revival as he regains his former strength, its evocation of noble sacrifice at the Pelennor Fields. And the same holds true with every one of the many motifs Shaw deploys across the Lord of the Rings soundtrack. By contrast, Bear McCreary hasn't really managed to summon up even the basics of the leitmotif across the two episodes we've had so far. This is one of the larger and understated reasons we're having such trouble identifying the various places we see. Shaw identifies Rohan in its many moods. McCreary hasn't been able to identify Lindon, or the Southlands, or Foradwaith. Mighty Morphid Power Elf kind of has her own motif, there's a hint of one at least, but it's not pronounced and it isn't memorable, in part because he hasn't scored it correctly, the instrumentation doesn't make the thing noticeable, and in part because he doesn't seem to have conceptualized the character in his notation. There's simply nothing of Mighty Morphid Power Elf in what he's trying to convey musically, though this might be because there isn't any character in her to convey. I mention it here though because Numenor is the first pronounced motif that really stands out in the show. We hear it on our arrival here and we'll hear it on our departure from it later. And it's… it's a start? The soundtrack generally improves over the course of these three episodes? Which is positive. The theme itself is, I would argue, a little bit too long for its function. The Numenor motif is actually not particularly sure like in its instrumentation, it does owe something to John Williams himself, but it also trails off in a way that his motifs wouldn't. It doesn't repeat often enough to stick in the mind. It's a little bit too convoluted to be completely memorable, though I think the opening is strong. It's something McCreary will need to do more of, not only for the sake of his own soundtrack, but for the world he is tasked with depicting. It's not just the tune we remember when we hear the Imperial March, it's a character. It's not just the score we feel for in The Lord of the Rings, it's the people and places and ideas to which that score is attached. I think McCreary does have this in him, or perhaps will with more practice and training. It might be the Rings of Power has just come too soon for him, and he's certainly not being helped by the absence of strong themes, characters, and ideas to give expression to. But that's enough with the boring music stuff, so we'll go back to the plot. Ocean Man, Mighty Morphic Power Elf, and Hunk arrive at the docks, and Mighty Morphic Power Elf does some essential but retroactive world building. She explains to Hunk that the Numenorians are not men like him because they sided with the elves against Morgoth, while his people sided with Morgoth against the elves. Uh, okay, here angry young white guy from the previous video is instructive. This is unnecessary dialogue in-universe. Hunk should already know all of this. They are his direct ancestors. The argument might well be, well, it was a long time ago. He didn't live through it. Maybe his people have just forgotten all about it. And yeah, forgetting vital information is the norm in this show. The elves forgot about fucking Sauron after all. Which would be forgivable were the show not condensing the timeline because thousands of years should have elapsed between Morgoth's defeat and the present day. And yet, angry young white guy from episode 1 hadn't forgotten about any of this. He brings it up in his argument with Don Lemon. It's quite common knowledge apparently, except where the show remembers that it isn't. And he's younger and further removed from these events than Hunk is. If angry young white teen knows it, Hunk should know it too, so Mighty Morphic Power Elf should have no need to explain any of it. There is another problem with this exchange that's going to become more pronounced as time goes on, and that's the placing of information. This show tends to fill in details retroactively. For example, in episode 1, we learn that Morgoth killed the Trees of Light, even though he didn't, and the elves went to war with him, and that's pretty much it. It's not until episode 2 that the show decides to explain the existence of the Silmarils and Morgoth's fondness for them, and that's vital contextual information if the preceding episode's events are to make any sense, because that's the cause of the fight in the first place. But then Rings of Power still managed not to actually tie these two things together, or hasn't done so yet. And then, it's not until episode 3 that we hear the first mention of the Valar. Mighty Morphid Power Elf is filling in information the show left out of its own setup. We were in Valinor at the opening scenes of episode 1, goddammit! There was a whole voiceover intended to set the scene and describe pivotal events in the past. But not once until the third episode have we heard anything about the Valar. And yet without the Valar, none of what happens until this point actually makes any sense. It would be like giving a lecture about the Crusades and describing in a couple of sentences how Jerusalem was conquered, but not telling anybody about who the Crusaders were, 
why they were crusading, what religions they adhered to, or even mentioning the existence of God. Compare Rings of Power's opening monologue with that of Fellowship at the Ring, and the difference is once again stark. Collateral in Fellowship fills us in on the history that makes sense of our present condition. It's short, it's perfunctory, it doesn't drag or introduce unnecessary detail, but it covers all the most relevant information. By contrast, Rings of Power's opening monologue was short, was perfunctory, but gave us next to nothing of the why of events. In fact, it skipped over the most important events, and the show is now filling us in retrospectively in forced exposition. But whereas Galadriel's monologue in Fellowship also shows us the important events, Rings of Power is just telling us an exposition during scene transitions, and that's a much less effective form of storytelling, not least because it begs many more questions than it answers, and throws in fragments of lore with massive consequences and connotations that the show can't explore or explain to us properly. You can repair some of this damage retroactively, and the show is attempting to do that here, but the order of events, the way in which we glean essential information, is backwards. We see the consequences, and then, a couple of episodes later, if we're lucky, a character will have a couple of lines mentioning fragments of the causes of those same consequences. I made an unkind Jenga tower joke in the previous video, but the nicer version I'll deploy here is that it's like trying to play Jenga by starting with the top layer. And that is not how the game fucking works. We were also left with a number of questions, not all of which the show intends. For example, if the Valar now do exist in this universe, what role are they going to play? Because they're integral to the fall of Numenor, which this show will presumably go on to depict. But if they're made so integral, well, then we have to ask why they did nothing in the run-up to the war mentioned in the first episode. If you've read The Silmarillion, you'll know, of course, but most people won't have read that. And even if they have, the show has discarded so much of it that it's not actually that reliable as a guide anymore, save perhaps for a few key elements, the fall of Numenor being one of them. If, though, the Valor are going to be invoked in the eventual destruction of Numenor, they are being given an incredible amount of power and agency, but the only way we can square that with their earlier absence from proceedings is just to kind of forget about them in that moment? Just kind of forget? Again? I really don't think it would have been hard to fix this. You could have actually just added a couple of lines to the opening monologue to explain that the gods, the Valar, refused to help the elves in their fight against Morgoth, and so the elves rebelled against them and went off to fight. That sets us up with the existence of gods who could have helped, and so who do have agency in the world, meaning that any subsequent mentions and invocations and potential actions build on established knowledge and answers questions posed at the top of the program. You could even have used it to at least hint at those passages of lore the show presumably won't and or can't use directly, such as the kinslaying. Merely reference it as some kind of tragedy, some kind of rebellion or betrayal of the gods that occurred and that tarnishes the elves non-specifically, giving the impression of grave deeds and consequences without needing to really explain what they were specifically. The story is then built from its foundations, rather than the writers hastily trying to fill those foundations in on the spur of the moment. But as it is, the clunky exposition continues, and Hunk has been reduced to the useful questioner role. His entire input in this exchange is to facilitate Mighty Morphid Power Elf's exposition. Since when did men like me build kingdoms such as this? These men are not like you. Men stood with the elves. As a reward, the Valar granted them this island. It has changed much since then. Do I detect a note of envy? Sorrow. What happened? Numenor began to turn away our ships. Why? We may be about to find out. Since when did men like me build kingdoms such as this? Do I detect a note of envy? What happened? Why? Okay, let's just try and add two and two together and see how the show came up with five. Mighty Morphid Power Elf begins by saying Numenor is very different now than it used to be because it turns away elvish ships. So, if that's the case, how can she be sorry that it's changed? How can she even know that it really has changed? She hasn't been here because the ships are turned away. The turning away of the ships is the only information we are given about the profound change she somehow knows the island has undergone. But when asked why that happened, she confesses she doesn't know. So, so no, you don't know that it's profoundly changed in sorrow-making ways, do you? You just know that you don't know anything except that you are not allowed in. 
That should create curiosity in Mighty Morphid Power Elf, perhaps fear, or at least foreboding. It shouldn't create deep sadness, because she's been precluded from knowing what she would need to know to feel sad in the first place. I think the show is trying to fast forward its development of Numenor's character, but it fails because it's jumping to silly conclusions. Having jumped to silly conclusions, it doesn't feel the need to actually build the character of the place. You could have accomplished the desired effect with wary caution on Mighty Morphid Power Elf's part, a belief that something is wrong, the nature of which she does not know. That indeed is her conclusion in this exchange. That could become sadness once she finds out the reason for the change, and what the change represents and what it entails. Again, it could be accomplished with a small change to just a couple of her lines. It wouldn't require that we rewrite her character or her reactions because, uh, well, I mean, she, well, no, both of those need redoing, but not because of this scene. They just need redoing because she doesn't really have either of those to begin with. She just moves through the world as though every day is her time of the month. You might almost say, there is a tempest in her. Again, recourse to the law might have been helpful. We can deduce from this information that we are in mid to late stage Numenor. Numenor and the elves were indeed once close allies, but they didn't begin to really fall out until the first war against Sauron, when Numenor sent a massive force to repel him after the establishment of Mordor and his forces there. They beat him and they capture him, and they bring him into Numenor, which then allows him to corrupt the mind of the king, which then leads to Numenor's downfall. There has, as far as we know, been no such war at this point in the show's history. Numenor, under Sauron's influence, became vast and powerful, but it also became warlike and tyrannical. The Numenorians had already settled occasionally along the coast of Middle-earth, but they now did so en masse and became militaristic and dictatorial, leading to ruptures with the elves whom they oppressed. The reason the Numenorians settled in Middle-earth is that they were forbidden by the Valar from traveling so far west that they could no longer see their own island because, if they did, they might come across Valinor and the Undying Lands. And unlike the elves who were blessed with eternal life, the men were doomed to die. The elves told them this was a blessing, they didn't believe them. Things got, uh, things got complicated, God got angry, but we might get to that later. But if any of that were the case in this show, why would the ship have been in place to rescue Mighty Morphid Power Elf and Hunk in the previous episode? They were so far west they couldn't at that time see their own island, so they would already have broken the, uh, broken the injunction, wouldn't they? And God would have killed them. More pertinently though, and more relevantly for later setup, we've got absolutely no indication that the Numenorians have settled in Middle-earth at this point in the show's continuity. In fact, we're led to believe that they barely ever visited. So we're in this weird historical limbo. We aren't given any setup, we're just plonked into the middle or the end point of Numenor's story, but we know nothing about Numenor itself or its relationship with the world, and in fact, as we'll shortly see, it doesn't really have one. This is a problem the show has with borrowing selectively from the lore, because it's borrowing events that are contingent upon things that they have discarded, meaning they have to fill in substantial world building gaps to make the thing make sense, but they haven't made any serious attempt to do that yet and what silly attempts they have made just reveal their deficiencies as writers. Mighty Morphid Power Elf and Sarah, I mean Halbrand, lose track of Ocean Man during their conversation, but he pops back up and tells them they don't want to get lost in this city without an escort. Except that right behind them, you can see there are guards, they're, they're right there, the two who accompanied them from the dark. They do have an escort, he's, he's literally behind you. Open your eyes. This, uh, this puts me in mind of a minor British Labour Party member of parliament whose name is David Lammy. He once gave an interview to camera complaining that he hadn't seen a policeman all day while a policeman was standing right behind him. Um, if, if it feels like neighbourhood policing has vanished, it's not around you. We haven't seen a police while I've been here and I've been here for a little while now. Very funny, very embarrassing. Glad to see the, uh, the writers of this show are living up to some high standards here. Hunk then takes a look at a nearby blacksmith and gives us an enigmatic expression. This will almost certainly become very relevant, not only later in this episode, but for the Sauron question the show thinks it's keeping us on tenterhooks to answer, so we will come back to that presently. We then enter the city hall, or the palace, where Ocean Man is told that the Queen Regent is just too busy to deal with them at the moment. There are three principal players we are about to be introduced to on our whistle-stop tour of Numenor. The Queen Regent herself, Tar Miriel, who is daughter of the King, Tar Palantir, here decrepit and bedridden, and R. Farazan. 
There are actually several versions of their story penned by Tolkien himself, and it's not really clear that the show is going to use any of them. It is going to make its own one up. I wonder how those changes will pan out. I wonder if they'll live up to the same astonishingly low standard as every other change that's been made so far. The general thrust of Tolkien's account has Ar Farazon usurping Tar Muriel after Tar Palantir's death by forcing her to marry him, thereby taking her title as ruler. It is Ar Farazon who decides to embark on the expedition against Sauron, and he brings Sauron back as his prisoner, only then for Sauron to complete his corruption that already existed in the hearts of many Numenorians anyway. The men, having settled in Middle-earth, became jealous of the elves' immortality and they thought that death that they had to suffer was a curse, and despite the elves attempting to tell them that Iluvatar and the gods had given them death as a kind of reward, the men refused to believe them and it was this fear, this longing, this loathing, this jealousy that Sauron plays off when Ar brings him back to Numenor. And he corrupts Ar he corrupts the men of Numenor, he turns them against the Valar, he turns them to worship Morgoth, and this part of the Silmarillion includes blood, sacrifices, and all that kind of lovely stuff. Eventually, he incites Ar to invade Valinor itself, and that prompts Manwe, the head of the Valar, to beseech Iluvatar, who is God himself, for aid. And so God breaks the world. He makes the earth round for the first time, it has hitherto been flat. He curves it, he turns it into a sphere, the sphere we now know today, which changes so much of the geography. It floods Numenor entirely, it buries Ar Farazan under a mountain until he is released at Armageddon, and much of Middle-earth is also damaged by this immense flood, including Lindon, which we saw in the previous episode, The Kingdom of Gil-galad. Now, I mention all of this because I'm inviting you to recall what I said earlier about the problems the show is inviting by crunching so much history together. It isn't as though they needed to do that, there is plenty of the history of Numenor it could have explored, even with its limited rights, its limited access to the law. The fact it is voluntarily condensing its timeline means it is, equally voluntarily, foregoing fantastic stories that it could have told. And even if you don't trust that the writers could have told fantastic stories, it's also doing away with the amount of time that could have at least allowed them to tell fantastic stories. Instead, we're rushing through thousands of years' worth of history, and what we get at the end is a hot mess. In the palace audience chamber, once it is known that Mighty Morphid Power Elf is indeed an elf, the Queen Regent decides she's not busy after all. A Mighty Morphid Power Elf introduces herself to Queenie with her typically offensive lack of charm and grace, while the show has decided to turn Hunk into Bronn from Game of Thrones, meaning he plays off her ornate and elaborate titles with some simple and irreverent quirky humour. Galadriel of the Noldor, daughter of the Golden House of Finarfin. Commander of the Northern Armies of High King Gilgalad. Halbrand. This is Shaga, son of Dolph, chieftain of the Stone Crows. Timit, son of Timit, ruler of the Burned Men. This fair maid is Chella, daughter of Chek, leader of the Black Ears. And here we have Bronn, son of. You wouldn't know him. Hell, I'm pretty sure even his facial expressions are bronze. Everything about him in this scene is bronze. It's almost like the writers and even the cast really want to do Game of Thrones. And, uh, I know I said I'd be spreading this stuff out, but I'm, I'm hurting in my laws. Ugh. Mighty Morphid Power Elf is about as offensive and bitchy as she can possibly be in demanding passage back to Middle-earth. I have... No idea why they've decided to portray her in this way. It's not characterful, it's just incredibly off-putting. She demands, essentially, a ship to take them back to Middle-earth. But a man with a great big bushy beard, Ar Farazan, who in this telling is Chancellor of Numenor, well, he tells her that it's been centuries since a ship of Numenor was allowed to make that trip, never mind on behalf of an elf. But, uh, but no, no, no. Again, Numenorians settled in Middle-earth at least according to Tolkien's account. Oh, of course, it's well established that we're not going by his account, but if they're going to tell us something like this, you'd think they might try and explain why that is. Well, they will get there, and we will get there too. And just, just wait for it. It's, it's a truly special thing. They took our jobs! Yeah, they're down! They took our jobs! Because Mighty Morphin Power Elf has about as much understanding of decency and human interaction as Jimmy Savile drunk in a morgue. And of course, it isn't true, except in the sense that the Numenorians bailed the elves out in fighting both Morgoth and Sauron, 
Or, I, well, I guess just Morgoth in this show. They haven't fought Sauron yet. I don't know. I don't think the show does either. I don't think it cares. We also don't have a reason for the Numenorians' hatred of the elves, as mentioned. In the lore, there are two broad factions among the Numenorians. There are the Faithful, who, as the name might suggest, are faithful to the elves, but principally to the Valar. And then there are the King's Men, who gradually come to resent both. This is because they fear death, as I have mentioned, and they resent the Valar have foisted it upon them while denying them access to the Undying Lands. It's this fear that Sauron plays off when he arrives, it's the reason he so easily corrupts them. The king at this time is Tar Palantir, and Tar Palantir is one of the faithful, but he's an exception proving the norm because the king's men are the predominant force and they have been for some time. We are going to get mentions of both these factions in this episode, but because unlike in the lore, the show has it that the Numenorians have seemingly confined themselves to their island already, rather than colonizing Middle-earth or mixing with the elves or interacting with any other races at all, We've not got a history of interaction with the elves that can explain their hostile attitude here. We don't have the history of either faction or their reasons for being. We don't know or understand and we're not told the history of the faithful or the king's men or their reasons for existing or their reasons for opposing each other. It's one of those weird instances where the show is relying on foreknowledge of the lore that it is otherwise distorted or discarded, meaning that it's impregnable to normies and not even a good guide to Tolkien fans. The show is going to have to invent a reason, you'd think, or at least to work in some variant of that one found in the lore, and if past experience is any guide, they are going to do it tactlessly and tastelessly and it will seem forced and shallow and horrible. Speaking of forced and shallow and horrible, the dialogue. The dialogue. As so often in the show, it is fucking abysmal. Mighty Morphid Power Elf and Queenie have an argument in which, for no very good reason, Mighty Morphid Power Elf threatens to kill someone to get off the island. Then if blood be the price of passage, I will pay it. But one way or another, I will depart. I welcome you to try. I have no need of your welcome. I, mean, I guess idioms aren't a thing where she comes from, because that was quite clearly a figure of speech. But then again, having heard the elf similes before... Washing away the last remnants of our enemy like a spring rain over the bones of a spoilt cock. I guess maybe it's just too subtle and she didn't pick up on it? But now Queenie doesn't understand idioms either because she tells Mighty Morphid Power Elf... And you are quickly wearing out yours. Guards! What, what the fuck is going on? What is the reason for this instant mutually assured bitch destruction? This is all so rushed and contrived. Why have they decided to have Mighty Morphid Power Elf assume the ultimate form of frigid cow permanently? There's no reason for us to sympathize with her. She is flatly unlikable. I said all this in my last video. There has been absolutely no improvement, but it's such a bizarre decision. Having been born in Valinor in the First Age, Mighty Morphid Power Elf is thousands of years old at this point. She's a lot older than young Ned is even, and yet in the short time we've spent with him, he's shown himself to be more developed and reasoned and mature than her. One of the reasons for not liking that they chose her as a protagonist is precisely that, for her to really go on an arc and grow, the show has to pretend like she hasn't already had millennia on which to go on an arc and grow. Here she is the oldest spoiled teenage bratty drama queen ever devised, with the possible exception of Taylor Lorenz. And you just know that somehow, without any self-reflection or betterment, her being queen bitch will somehow allow her to brute force her way through the plot. Ugh, hell, if people wind up liking her for it, we're gonna have no choice but to call her a Mary Sue. Bran, I mean Sauron, I mean Hunk, plays the diplomat and asks permission to stay, which is immediately granted them for three days by Big Bushy Beard, albeit on condition that Mighty Morphid Power Elf doesn't leave the palace grounds, so she says she won't be a prisoner. And he makes some quip about kneecapping stallions. Sooner kneecap a stallion than seek to imprison the mighty commander of the Northern Army. <laughs> and the extras were obviously told to laugh at this, but uh, I didn't. It didn't make any sense, and it wasn't funny. But permission is granted in any case, and the show needs to move on. So it has Mighty Morphid Power Elf just accept the offer, and despite having just threatened to kill someone or even everyone to get what she wants. Hunk goes up to Ocean Man as the meeting disperses. Everyone has simply stopped paying attention to them because, well, we're about to see why. And he hugs Ocean Man to thank him for saving them on the raft. 
While he's hugging Ocean Man, he steals Mighty Morphid Power Elf's dagger back. Now, I'm no magician, but, um, how? Where does, where does he hide it? He doesn't have any sleeves. He can't have concealed it in his tunic without moving his hands. There's no gap I could detect where, off screen, he might have been able to do this. Ocean Man is looking at him the whole time. And you'd think an experienced warrior such as he might have guarded his weapons a little more closely? Then there is a weird and nonsensical exchange between Mighty Morphid Power Elf and Hunk, where Mighty Morphid Power Elf nags him about saving the people of the kingdom we learned he was thrown out of in the last episode, but he just wants to stay here now because there's opportunity and peace. Great character motivations here, much consistency. It just reminds us how spectacularly rushed and contrived this entire setup has been. She jumps off a cliff. Uh, oops, scripting error, but hey, don't we just wish... She jumps off a ship, thousands of miles from shore. She just happens to swim by a raft. That just happens to have hunk aboard. They just happen to escape Cthulhu's gay fish and immediately set about having an argument that just happens to contain all the information she needs to know where to go to find some orcs and kill them. And please remember this, it becomes very relevant later. And he just happens to have on him the symbol that proves that he's exactly the person she needs to know to get her there. Uh... I guess his desire to stay makes sense if he's Sauron. Now I have, as I think I mentioned at this point, spent an ungodly number of hours discussing these episodes over at EFAP, and there's been some disagreement as to how to interpret Hunk's stated desire for peace, not only in this scene, but in some subsequent scenes as well. I think this brew was amongst those who believed that what the show's writers are going to attempt to do is to essentially have Galadriel force Sauron to turn evil again. In other words, his desire to stay and to find peace is genuine, and it will be her fault that he turns evil again. In the course of the discussion, that became worryingly plausible. I am still, I am still sticking to my theory that he is subtly manipulating her to take him back there at the head of an army, to give him what he wants. There will be some dialogue at the end of this episode, which I maintain supports this point, but having fleshed this out with the EFAP guys, I, I'm not as uh, sure as I would really, really want to be that the show is not going to try and tell us that Sauron was actually good, genuinely a good guy in this scene. Are they actually going to try and make Sauron like an anti-hero or a tragic character or someone who could be good if he wanted to? Because that just breaks so much stuff, but I guess we'll find out. As Hunk and Mighty Morphid Power Elf leave the room, Big Bushy Beard has a chat with Queenie about Mighty Morphid Power Elf. They're both nervous that she's here, and they're cautious of giving her too much freedom or indeed help of any kind. Big Bushy Beard deploys one of the show's less tortured metaphors when he says, An avalanche can start with one stone. Now, it might not be the best example with which to raise this point, but since it has occurred to me now, I will. It is acceptable, it is even understandable, if one or two characters have a fondness for idioms, for metaphors, for similes. The problem Rings of Power has is that anyone and everyone is liable to come out with this kind of thing, albeit with a much more painful and convoluted example, irrespective of their place, age, background, and natural speech patterns. And the problem with that is that it means the writers are shining through their characters. Dwarves should not share speech patterns with Numenorean nobility. Elves should not share speech patterns with not hobbits. When all your characters speak in the same way, or use the same overtly ornate devices, it is you as the writer who is speaking through them and it is obvious to the audience that that is what happens. When the characters are so shallowly written that you can see the writer beneath their skin, that is not a good thing. Big Bushy Beard then explains to Queenie who Elendil is. I mean, shouldn't she know? He seems like a pretty important general in her army, but fuck it. He also explains that Elendil has a son in the navy, which is our excuse to cut away to the ocean where we are introduced to Isildur, Sailor Twink and his band of seamen. They're training for the right to graduate and become full, proper, full-blooded, full-bodied seamen. But Sailor Twink gets distracted by an island, West Numenor, which we'll learn later has some significance to his family, and somebody almost dies, but it's fine, nobody even tells him off. We just get a weird captain talking bollocks about the sea. Master than the I'd call him Mako Tsunami, but I'm not sure there are enough Yu-Gi-Oh abridged fans in my audience. At least the ocean will never leave me. Right, ocean? 
Why don't you ever answer me, Ocean? Fuck it, though, I can't think of a better name for him. Do actions have no consequences in this navy? Sailor Twink just almost got somebody killed because he was daydreaming. No one, not him, not the rest of the crew, was upbraided for that. Everything just moves on as though a massive breach of protocol, routine, health and safety and discipline had not just occurred. <sighs> I wonder if that will be relevant later too. Mako Tsunami is full of boilerplate oceanic wisdom. There is no harsher master than the sea, is all he says in response to one of his seamen going flying through the air for no very good reason. And then, once they land ashore, the, the, best, the best one for meme potential. The sea is always right! The sea is always right! How, how the fuck he delivered that with a straight face, I don't know. What, what does it mean? How could anybody write that down, look at it on a page, hear it in rehearsals, hear it on set and not think, you know what, no, that's shite, I'm going to have to do that again. Although this guy seems to know. Sailor Twink's seamen friends have some strained banter. And then, because we don't have enough characters in this show already, a horse turns up with Sailor Twink's sister in tow. And the horse is a better actor than she is. She is another invention of this show, so no doubt she'll go on to be a very useful and worthwhile addition to this already bloated cast. We then cut back to some more backfilled exposition, as Queenie gives Ocean Man a lesson on Numenorean history and philosophy. The White Tree, which, yes, is the ancestor of the one we see in Minas Tirith, the Valar, and the Faithful. Then she has to clumsily tie it into the show's dialogue to keep up the pretense that it is not just doing another of its many exposition dumps. Now, is this the most significant or damning of issues? No, but once again it is very lazy writing, and it's much less engrossing for it, and, as I said in the last video, frequent laziness is indicative. It portends much greater writing cock-ups to come, this episode is going to go on to give us a prophecy of the downfall of Numenor, which is the reason for this exposition. It's only been placed here because the writers belatedly realized that they needed to actually clue the audience in on something of what happens. This is such CW level writing. I think I've used this example in other videos, but there is a Batwoman episode where she needs to take an incredible shot, so the show, however many episodes or even seasons in by that point, decides to tell us, in the same episode, that she's a crack shot. Fuck showing the audience, don't bother building that up, never mind arranging it so that when the moment comes, we can see it as an extension of the knowledge we already have about them. Nah, it needs to happen today, we didn't realize that until this point, so I guess we better come up with some rapid fire exposition to just, you know, cram it in there, so it makes sense when you see it in a few minutes time. A billion dollars, folks. A billion dollars went into this show. Queenie quizzes Ocean Man on the origin of his name, Elendil, and what that means. Elf friend, according to one translation, which conveniently allows her to interrogate him on whether he truly is an elf friend, and inform us then that elves have been unwelcome in Numenor since the time of her grandfather's great-grandfather. Um, well, except that her father is in the law, and I think has already been established in this show to be fond of the elves? Uh, is this a contradiction? I don't know that it is necessarily a contradiction because the show just hasn't done enough relevant world building to contradict anything yet, but married with what little information the average viewer has, it is at least paradoxical. We know that her father likes the elves and we know that he was, or if her title is to be believed, he still is the king, and he's just not on the throne because he's unwell and people didn't like him. Now though we're informed that his predecessors and her contemporaries all hate the elves, and she is, shall we say, artfully ambiguous on this point. To be clear, I'm not asking for a point-by-point -point explanation. It is acceptable, it is desirable even, to leave the audience asking questions. Uh, but two problems arise here. Number one, the best way to encourage questions of the audience is to provide them with loose ends of at least a partially formed tapestry, which we don't yet have. And then number two, given the pace at which we're flying through events, we're going to be leaving Numenor again very soon, does the audience actually have time to ask these questions and consider the possibilities before they cease to be timely? And then, number three, if events move on based on conclusions the audience has not been able to reach, how much of what follows will make sense? Is it even supposed to make sense? I get the strong impression it's moving so quickly in the hopes that we overlook the fact that it doesn't make sense. And then, fuck me the dialogue again. It just continues in its horrible, horrible way. 
Queenie asks why Ocean Man brought Mighty Morphid Power Elf back to Numenor. He says the sea put her in his path, and the sea is always right. Fucking, the sea is always right. To which she responds, the sea cannot commit treason. Treacherous is the sea! What, I, what the fuck does any of this mean, damn it? I played that actual Galadriel clip. I'm not too worked up about the apparent contradiction. These are two different groups of people, different attitudes, different upbringings. Maybe the sea did something mean to Galadriel at some point in her past. But no, the interplay between the sea is always right and the sea cannot commit treason. The implication seemingly being that Ocean Man did or might have committed treason by obeying the sea, which is always right. So in that case, why is that treason? If the Numenorians believe the sea is always right, is the sea suborning treachery? Is this some kind of fishy entrapment going on? How do these characters actually reason their way through these sentences? Or do they not? Is it just as all the rest of the dialogue is, designed to give the vague impression of meaning and import, but no actual substance because writing is hard? Ocean Man tells her that he only did what he thought was right, to which she responds, if that is truly your wish. What? What if- oh my fucking giddy fuck. If what is truly his wish, why do these sentences not string together? He said he only did what he thought was right. Does she mean that thinking he was doing something right was his wish? He wished to think that he was doing something right? Well, that makes dangerously little sense. It's not that he wished to do something he believed was right, it's that he did something he believed was right. This is clumsy as fuck. This is drunk clown on a pogo stick dancing through a minefield writing. Find better words, you hacks. But anyway, she says that if whatever was truly his wish was truly his wish, she needs him to perform her a service. And that then is this episode's first cliffhanger scene transition. These work when they are used sparingly, they do not work when you overuse them, which is what this show has done and will continue to do. I suppose it wants us to be intrigued, but I'm still stuck trying to untangle that fucking dialogue, but that's probably for the best, because I would otherwise be very, very, very bored. Moving on, you might think that given we've just been introduced to a brand new and very important place with brand new and very important characters, that the show might decide to linger here for a while to actually start building things out beyond the bare scaffolding they've just started erecting. But no, we have another Indiana Jones map sequence, and we're over at the Southlands with Don Lemon and the orcs that, for reasons known only to this show's writers, they have decided to turn into vampires, occasional vampires anyway, that sometimes fry when they are exposed to the sun. This, of course, is not lore accurate, the lore is more subtle than this. The orcs hate the sun because of the history they share with Melkor. The Valar place the sun in the sky quite some time after the trees are destroyed, and even Melkor in some sense fears it. Orcs then are weakened by the sun, they fear the sun, and they shun the sun. Saruman's genius with the Urukai was in creating a genus derived from the orc that can nonetheless move in daylight with relatively little issue. But the orcs aren't incapable of moving in the sun, they aren't supposed to fry as soon as it makes contact with their skin, they just hate it and loathe it and fear it. In this show though, they fry. Sometimes. But they have a genius workaround. They wear clothes. Yeah, that's all it takes, they wear clothes. This, this, has more issues than Ezra fucking Miller at a nightclub. If the orcs can go around in the sun by wearing clothes, they have no problem being in the sun. Just get fucking dressed you cretins or have one orc in every ten carrying a parasol as i think Morla suggested the show is also quite selective about when and how they fry sometimes they do and sometimes they don't they don't fry if there's a cloud over the sun for example but in that case just burn stuff and hide under the smoke oh god oh god foreshadowing there are lots of ways though that you can limit the sum if all it would have taken to equip them for the sun is a sombrero and a poncho, it would have made all the battles of the Third Age so much easier. Sauron probably would have won. And of course we get more problems. Don Lemon explains that the passages seemingly go under much of the Southlands, and that this must be how the orcs escape detection. 
And then, because the show doesn't trust us to remember the events of previous episodes, it clumsily reminds us by having some nameless co-prisoner explain that the orcs are searching for something, and Don Lemon's immediate response is, some kind of weapon, perhaps. Gee, what a very convenient plot-relevant assumption to make. The most convenient plot-relevant of all the assumptions you could make. Hey guys, remember that sword in the last episode? That's relevant, remember? Look, have some handy dialogue to jog your memory from characters who have absolutely no connection to that sword and so no reason to immediately make this conclusion. And for fuck's sake, it can't help itself. Leave any character talking for more than 20 seconds and they will inevitably cock up something they just finished saying. Remember how this guy literally just finished telling us that the orcs had been tunneling to avoid detection? Well, he's now informed us that they've been ransacking village after village. Meaning they would have been fucking detected, you lettuce shagging twat weasel. We had this problem in the last episode. Incredibly far sighted elves with watchtowers dotted all over the place didn't spot the tunnels. Fine, fine, you have to be kind to the writers, but you can make that make some kind of sense. But scores of ransacked villages? The last one was on fire for fuck's sake. There was smoke billowing into the fucking air. Do you not think they might have noticed that? And hell, the stretch of the tunnel they're digging now is out in the fucking open. They have to chop down trees to make progress through it. We get a panning out shot where it turns out they've been burning the forest down along the line of the tunnel. Ooh, ooh, writing, oh, show, oh no. And now we have characters just magically knowing shit. The Tower Warden from the last episode, who you'll probably have forgotten all about, but whom we're obliged to remember because the show is about to make us try and care about him, well, he just randomly comes out with all the plot necessary information. The Orcs are searching for a thing, they've ransacked villages for it, they have a successor to Morgoth, they worship him, they call him Adar, etc, etc. And the Warden thinks that Adar is Sauron, who we were recently told the Elves had forgotten all about, but I guess we've forgotten that the Elves had forgotten all about him. Okay then. How does he know all of this? How long has he been here? How do the timelines work in this show? We have no idea how much time is elapsing. Per our previous Don Lemon scenes, it's pretty much a straight line of perhaps half a day between him leaving the warden at the village, flirting with his woman, finding the sick cow, finding the burned out village, going into the tunnel and getting captured. Assuming I'm right about that, how has the warden been captured and discovered all this in that little time? How have all these elves been captured in that little time? Apparently nobody told the orcs that careless talk costs lives. We're told that Ada, which is an elvish name, could well be Sauron, because Sauron had many names. I have no doubt the show is going to want us to think that Ada is Sauron at least for a little bit, but nah, my money is still on hunk, for reasons we will come back to. We get another dumb simile. Sweep the enemy from these lands like salt from a table. Uh, but then, thankfully, they're interrupted by an orc before anyone can point out that that makes no fucking sense. The orc tells them to cut down a tree. The warden doesn't want to cut down the tree. Because the writers know fuck all about elves except the most superficial things, they decide to have a rebellion to save the tree. There is a tweet. There is a tweet that says this is the most Tolkien of all the things. Shills, just get in the fucking sea. The head orc guy randomly then promises water rations. But... Uh, why? I mean, it's self-evidently a trap. Surely no one is going to be a silly fuck and take the water. Nope, the warden is a silly fuck and he takes the water. He passes it around, and some random we don't know or care about gets his throat cut, and the show goes all slow-mo and the music gets very sad. As though we're supposed to feel really deeply sad about whoever the fuck this is. The problem is, I'm pretty sure the only line we've had exchanged between him and any other character until this episode is something about him smelling. Praise where it's due, the choir music here is lovely. This is something McCreary has shown he's quite good at. There have been a few occasions now where things have slowed and quietened down and he has deployed the choir to good effect. The problem is that the music is trying to evoke emotions that we just don't have for what we're seeing. We've only just arrived. We barely even know our protagonist in this scene. Don Lemon is, for all intents and purposes, a plank of wood with a face drawn on it. All we know of him is that he fancies that, um, that one, that woman, still don't know her name. We absolutely do not know the Warden, although we know about as much about the Warden as we know about Don Lemon. This is the first time then we've spent any meaningful time with him. 
and we absolutely know nothing whatever the fuck about the random guy they have just decided to kill. I think we maybe seen him once before. He's basically just an NPC. He has no established relationship with Don Lemon. He has no relationship at all with the audience. He has no relationship with the plot, except that the plot needed to sacrifice an NPC in this moment. But anyway, everything slows down, we get the pretty choir music, and Don Lemon is very sad. And the show is blatantly reaching out to pluck on our heartstrings, but we haven't even got that instrument out yet. We've had no reason to. This is all just stuff happening. It's paint by numbers. It is entirely unearned. Hell, compare it even with Hammer in The Two Towers. Hammer is Theoden's door ward. He's the guy who greets Aragorn, Gimli, Legolas, and Gandalf and tells them to hand over their weapons. We know more about him than we know about this elf guy. Hammer is killed by a warg on the way to Helm's Deep, and the film doesn't so much as pause to take a breath to linger on that. We're invited then to feel a bit sad later when we meet his son, but that's it. That's quite subtle, but then you make the connection, and you realize that this is what war entails, and no one really has time to mourn yet. Rings of Power, though, is taking a character with less development than fucking Hammer and portraying it as though it were the death of Boromir. It's just a very, very strange choice. And it doesn't even add anything to the show because we get straight back to the argument about the tree and Don Lemon agrees to cut it down and save everyone's lives. He apologizes to the tree. He has a bit of a cry. Such Tolkien. The music tells us that this is all very significant and it's supposed to be. We know the elves do love nature, but absolutely nothing about this scene has been earned. And then because the show can't resist its panoramics, it does decide to do more damage to its setup Orcs tunneling to avoid detection? Nah, needn't have bothered. They can just burn and defile whole areas of woodland along the line of their tunnel. They can build a massive fucking trench. And nobody gave a shit. Christ in a Prius. Anyway, back in Numenor, Mighty Morphid Power Elf is sneaking off, but Ocean Man just happens to arrive in precisely the right place at the right time to catch her, and so she naturally threatens to kill him. This is just her default setting. I don't mind Ocean Man by contrast. I think he can act. He also gets some half-decent lines, but here he has done a dirty, because he's been used as one of the most glaring contrivances in the show so far. We learn he speaks Elvish. She asks how he knows it. He says, it's still taught in the Hall of Law back at his hometown. And so, for, um, reasons, I guess, because the writers couldn't think of any other way to get the plot moving again, they're off, they're off across Numenor. Immediately, she knows exactly where they're going. He says it's a short ride. She says, did you say ride? And no, this is not an invitation for them to fuck, but it is the prelude to our eyes getting fucked by perhaps the most cringe slow-mo shot in the last decade's worth of slow-mo shots. Ooh, that's, that's embarrassing. It gives one of McCreary's motifs a chance to try and impress itself upon us, but we are quickly distracted by this wanton self-indulgence. It kind of works for the horse. It kind of works for the dress. It categorically does not work for the face. Humans generally look a bit weird in ultra slow-mo anyway, but they look especially weird when they've been told that they have to look overjoyed, but have no real idea how to convey that emotion. Mighty Morphid Power Elf doesn't look happy here. She looks like a bit of the saddle has gone up somewhere it shouldn't have, and because we're in very slow motion, she is stuck like that, in pain, grimacing in much the same way as the audience is. There's absolutely no reason for this shot. Again, you could have fixed it with a simple alteration. Keep the slow-mo for the horse and the dress, speed up again, all the way or near enough, for the face shot. Also, I don't know, maybe get her a new face, or at least ask her to try another expression. I assume they had multiple takes of this. Is this really the best one they had? The Jackson films had their slow-mo moments, of course, but these were A, seldom this slow, and B, seldom this slow on facial close-ups, and C, seldom deployed this pointlessly. They were used in the main to convey a point. The reaction to Gandalf's fall, which masterfully contrasts with the pace and freneticism of the preceding chase, and provides payoff to the still tension of the fight with the Balrog. Then Boromir's doom when we realize he's going to die, but he has resolved to lay down his life for his friends. There are a couple that are only used for contrast purposes, like the Nazgul chasing the hobbits through the woods in Fellowship, for example, but by and large, they all add value to their scenes and perform some sort of dramatic purpose. 
This shot though, well, it adds a bit, right up until the face shot. Mighty Morphid Power Elf isn't a bad looking lass normally, but here her penises across the world did shrink and be downcast with much fear and suffering. The shot closes with a random lingering focus on a piece of rock that looks like the geographic embodiment of whatever it was she accidentally sat on to make that face, and then we cut back to Hunk, who is trying to black himself a job as a smith. This, by the way, is evidence for his Sauronness. Sauron was known in his time as a master smith. He was also a shapeshifter, with obvious ties to the Southland, since these will eventually become Mordor. He also needs to reach Numenor in order to corrupt it from within, and given this show's penchant for speeding up the most relevant details, the fact he is already here would be very convenient for the writers. There is other evidence too, some of which we will see later, such as his penchant for manipulation. The show is trying to throw us a bait to distract us. Even Steve in the last two episodes was, as I think, designed in part to have us asking whether he might be Sauron after all. His lying in the fiery meteor crater, for example, resembles a flaming eye. The fire around him is not hot, and cold fire is established in episode 1 as being evidence of great evil. His arrival in a meteor is not too dissimilar to his preferred mode of transport at the end of The Hobbit, while it also seems to bring death alongside it, the blackening leaf in Gil-galad's hand, later the dead fireflies in his. But Steve is still, quite obviously, supposed to be Gandalf, even if the next episode is going to lay it on exceptionally thick that the show wants you to believe otherwise. The only argument against Hunk as Sauron that has any merit, I guess at this stage in proceedings, if you haven't seen the subsequent episodes, would be Adar, uh, to whom we shall shortly be introduced. Adar is in the right place, the Southlands, at the appropriate time Sauron should have been there. The Numenorians will depart for Middle-earth to fight him, which could allow them to capture him and bring him back, but he would have first, or at least at some point, to come into contact with Celebrimbor for the forging of the rings, if Adar were the Sauron of the law, which he quite clearly is not. If I had to place my bet, before seeing the subsequent episodes, at the time I was drafting this first version of this script, my bet was that Adar would transpire to be a foil, a lieutenant of Sauron, who may indeed be captured and brought to Numenor, but Hunk will still be Sauron. And, well, we'll see if I'm proven right. Anyway, Hunk isn't allowed to work as a smith until he has a special badge, so he picks a fight with a young Brian Blessed who has said badge. Brian Blessed is a stupid fat hobbit, I mean a man. He is very anti-immigrant. <laughs> I'm looking forward to where this is going. I'm looking forward to it about as much as I would look forward to being given an enema with sulfuric acid. But Hunk becomes Bron again. He can shapeshift into characters from better shows apparently, and he buys everyone a round of drinks which allows him to steal Brian Blessed's badge. I did wonder where he got the money for the food and beverages he buys them here, but I don't think it's a huge stretch of the imagination to suppose that he stole someone's purse. He walks off with the badge, but again conveniently, Brian Blessed and his gang of goons know exactly which side streets he went down, and they corner him. At which point, he decides he knows Kung Fu, and he beats the shit out of all of them, whereupon he is arrested. Over in the library, it transpires Mighty Morphid Power Elf wanted to go to the Hall of Law she was fortuitously told about before her horse aneurysm to find the meaning of Sauron's symbol. But if you thought that was contrived, just wait, just, just wait. It's going to get so much worse. The library looks lovely, by the way. Its aesthetic is delightful, but you will note how full it is. Scrolls, parchments, shelves and shelves and shelves of the stuff It'd take the best librarian a good long time to find any reference to so obscure a symbol as the one Mighty Morphid Power Elf found. Because remember, she searched for centuries, and she only found two of them. Even if Angry Floor Boy found one in episode one because the show exists on Mystery Box Riding, but fuck that, the librarian courteously waits long enough for Mighty Morphid Power Elf to have a perfunctory law building conversation with Ocean Man about Elros, who built the library, whose brother is Elrond. They also just about managed to squeeze in some problematic law substitution. It's explained that the king was forced from the throne because he was too nice to the elves. In the law, he was indeed nice to the elves. The only king drawn from the ranks of the faithful in a good long time, and the last while Numenor stood. But in the law, he died, which paved way for Ar Farazan to marry his daughter, Tar Miriel, and take the throne. Rings of Power has a much clunkier version of events. Here, Ocean Man explains that they forced him from the throne 
because he was nice to the elves, and now he spends his days in a tower in the palace. But Tarmiriel, his daughter, rules in his place as queen regent, which poses problems. In the first place, I'm not sure it would be typical to dethrone a king only to ennoble his daughter, his closest relative, and the one personally closest to him, if your reasons for dethroning him were his perceived disloyalty to Numenor. Would you not have deposed his entire house, his immediate relations, in order to install a rival claimant from your own faction? In the second place, Queen Regents, as opposed to Queen Regnants, typically rule conditionally. They exercise power derived from another source, such as an heir who hasn't yet come of age. I don't believe that she has any children in this show, so with whose power is she acting as regent? It can't be the old king, surely, because he was removed. Except that he still carries the title of king, and later, we'll see Mighty Morphid Power Elf demand to negotiate with him over Queenie herself, which leaves you with the implication that she is acting as his regent. But she can't be his regent if he was dethroned, because that would seem at least to have missed the whole damn point of getting rid of him to begin with. World building, fuck it, no one needs this kind of stuff. Anyway, Mighty Morphid Power Elf's exchange with Ocean Man is far shorter than that legalistic spiel. And the librarian pops back into the scene. It hasn't been more than three minutes in universe since he first laid eyes on the incredibly rare symbol she showed him, and yet he has near instantly found the one document in the entire library that they need to move the plot along. And my god, how they move it along. Brace yourselves for this, it's a doozy. The entire library just happens to have one piece of paper on which that symbol has indeed been drawn. Without apparently reading anything at all, Ocean Man explains that it is the account of a human spy retrieved from an enemy dungeon. Uh, this then must have been hundreds if not thousands of years ago by the way, but I guess the paper survived. And there is a symbol drawn on it to record the tower's location. Mighty Morphid Power Elf looks at it. She looks at her copy of the symbol. They are indeed the same. She says, wait a moment, I must be blind. She walks over to the map, underneath the picture of Elrond that she saw earlier. She places the symbol on the map and turns it around. And wouldn't you know it, it's a symbol depicting fucking Mordor. My god, but it gets worse. The inscription on the ancient piece of fabric is written in black speech. You might remember that elves find it painful even to listen to black speech, but fuck it, she's fine. We, however, are not, because the speech is so foul and contrived that the sky darkens and we feel doom upon us. Mighty Morphid Power Elf translates, and I quote directly. It speaks not only of a place, but a plan. A plan by which to create a realm of their own, where evil would not only endure, but thrive. A plan to be enacted in the event of Morgoth's defeat. By his successor. Calavria? Matters are worse than I imagined. Uh, uh, what the... Where, where do you even begin? Where can you start? with writing like this. So, to recap, fortuitously, a human spy was locked up in a tower in the Southlands thousands of years ago. Somehow, while he was locked up, he heard the evil people lay out in every relevant detail their diabolical scheme to create an evil realm where evil could thrive, created by Morgoth's successor, and either the evil people laid out their diabolical schemes within earshot of the human spy, who just happened to have a quill, ink, and parchment on him, or they wrote all of this down themselves, with all the information that Mighty Morphid Power Elf would need, thousands of years later, to explain the plot to the audience of Rings of Power. There are fucking Bond villains more serious than this. This is, this is unbefucking leavable. You thought the weird slow-mo constipation shot with silly. No, no, you do not know what silliness is. Listen, Mighty Morphid Power Elf jumps off a ship, is picked up by a raft. That is a contrivance. She meets useful and probably evil hunk. That is a contrivance. When they are then picked up by a ship that can't legally sail where they're floating, well, that's also a contrivance. When they are then brought to the one place she needed to be to get to the library she just learned about in a chance conversation, that's a contrivance. Where it turns out 
they have one copy of a thousand year old spy's account from the Southlands with a map of Mordor which she spots because she happened to see a map earlier. That is a contrivance. And this thousand year old spy's account just happens to lay out all the bare essentials of Sauron's master plan. What absolute cognition retardant, womble brained, inbred platypus wrote this shit? And to top it all off, it's irrelevant. It's all irrelevant. She already knew about the Southlands. She was already going to the Southlands. All this does is fast forward to the conclusion of a mystery the show could have surprised us with. Or at least surprised its characters with. Hell, have her go to the Southlands and arrive too late. Have her go there and realize what she's up against is so much bigger than she could have foreseen. Have her beaten back. Have her lose. Have her knocked away. Have Sauron's full might be revealed as a shock to her. Do anything. Do anything except this. This is staggeringly awful writing. The only thing that could possibly make it worse is if, when she arrives in the Southlands, it turns out that this entire sequence is irrelevant because all of that happens anyway. And, um, well, we'll get to that. And you know what? It gets even better. Because this symbol is a map reference, right? It's a map reference for the orcs to follow. Do you know what, um, do you know, I'm just going to three guesses, three guesses. I'm going to give you like 10 seconds. Do you know what you generally need for map references to make sense? Fucking maps. Let's play a game. Here's a random symbol. Guess what it is. Go on. Try it. Have another three guesses. You're going to need it to get to the next mystery box because that's how good things are written. You know what this symbol is, right? It's quite obvious to you. I'm sure you know what it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You were right. Let me just open Google Maps. Let me just find the bit of the map I was looking for. Let me rotate that symbol. And yeah, you were completely right. As I'm sure you guessed, it is the island of Thera in Greece. That's where you're going. And you knew that. Definitely. You, you absolutely figured that out, didn't you? Yeah, the, the orcs definitely have access to Google Maps. Everyone in Middle Earth has Google Maps. No, they didn't have access to fucking Google Maps. Either this map point is so widely known across Middle Earth that the orcs know exactly where to go just by looking at it. In which case, it is so widely known that Mighty Morphid Power Elf didn't need to wait until she saw the map in Numenor to make this connection. Or you do need the map, in which case the symbol is probably useless to the vast majority of orcs because orcs do not carry fucking maps around with them. What is this writing? A billion dollars. It's a billion dollars worth of writing. A billion dollars. But they couldn't hire an actual non retail yeah. writer. Not a single one. Fucking Dora the Explorer is better than this shit. Lego Star Wars puzzles are better than this. My god. Sod it. We get some more intriguing music, but... It bizarrely doesn't at all fit the scene it depicts. This music is sinister. It reminds you, kind of, maybe of the dwarves, but instead, no. This weird, ominous soundtrack is the transition to the fucking Harfords. I mean, I mean, they're not hobbits. Prancing around, singing a cute little song. What the hell is going on in this show? I wonder if the ominous soundtrack is foreshadowing some dark turn in their story. But um, again, going back to my first draft of this script, I had no idea. I had no idea. But we're coming to that in a moment. Don't worry. Don't worry. We're going to get to the Harfords. That's um, that's some special shit. Now, I said in the last video that the Not Hobbits at least had some charm to them. They are losing it, however, quite quickly in their first shot in episode 3, which decides it wants to do a little pantomime dance with them. You might remember that this group is hyper-cautious and afraid. They have a pressing need to migrate because there have been hunters spotted in their close vicinity recently. Do you maybe think that prancing about and chanting through your secret little gypsy village might not be the best thing to do if your goal is to remain hidden? And because things are spiraling rapidly downhill, do please remember the words Nobody goes up train. Nobody walks alone. That's right. Nobody goes off trail, and nobody walks alone. Nobody goes off trail, and nobody walks alone. Because the show is about to turn this previously affable bunch of communitarian gremlins into Darwinian monster midgets who probably eat their own dead.
Yep. Yeah, that's that's where we're going. Brandy's dad twisted his ankle in the last episode and he's still feeling it. So, having just heard that nobody goes off trail or walks alone, we learn they fear that they will be left behind because he can't carry their caravan on his twisted ankle. Okay, yeah, well, well, if you're watching this for the first time, you might be thinking, maybe that's an unfounded fear. Maybe they're just fretting needlessly. They wouldn't seriously just leave their injured neighbors behind to die, would they? The dad says, though, that they'll be fine because they'll stay at the front of the caravan. That, um, that poses some logistical questions. In the first place, how if your leg is fucked? In the second place, even if you started at the front of the caravan, wouldn't you be so slow that you'd eventually get to the back? Or do you mean to say that the people behind you wouldn't overtake the slowest person in the front? But if they wouldn't overtake the slowest person in the front, why would they leave behind the slowest person in the back? What's the difference? This is some weird hobbity variant of the trolley problem where both of the answers are shit. Even packs of wolves travel with the slowest member in the front. Are you really suggesting so? Are you really trying to tell me that this charming, affable bunch of proto-jippos are less civilized than fucking wolves? At night, Brandy and Parge have an argument about helping Steve find Lenny Henry's Starbuck. Oh, and guess what? They have a fight. Guess what the fight's about? Brandy being silly and naive and adventurous and just not like the blah, 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 every fucking time. Stop it. We, we know. We know this. Every scene. Every scene has the same argument. You know the rules. We're not supposed to be out this far. If we didn't do everything we weren't supposed to do, we'd hardly do anything at all. I can't believe I missed them. Well, maybe you ought to stick closer to home. That way you don't miss anything. Mm. Didn't you ever wonder? What else is out there? I've told you. Countless times we have each other. We're safe. That is how we survive. Brandyfoot, with your father's nose and always poking us into trouble. You are far too curious and meddlesome to have been born a Harfoot. This isn't some adventure, Nori. What's that supposed to mean? I didn't go looking for this. But you're not turning away. Because I can't. Because you won't. Why is it your problem? Play a different tune, show. We know all of this. I'm bored of this now. I would like to have some character development, please. You've had three hours. Okay, being, yeah, being kind. Let's be kind. These two characters do have some chemistry. It's a shame, though, that they're given very little to work with. Brandy finds the relevant page in the Starbook, but she's interrupted and she has to hide. Happily, Lenny Henry stops to compose some poetry, or maybe another racist comedy skit that he won't ever be cancelled for, and it gives her time to steal the page she needs as Podge turns up to distract him. The scene has its merits, the not hobbits are still, on the whole, charming, if you forget they're about to abandon their injured friends and just toddle off merrily. The show then borrows from Bilbo's party speech, quite overtly. In fact, Brandy and Podge are kind of Merry and Pippin too. The show is not afraid to, um, borrow from older and better productions. Again, though, I actually think, well, okay, okay, I have to split my mind here. When I first drafted this script, I thought this was a nice scene. It does actually do some good work fleshing out their lives, their society. It fills in their memories and their feelings. It is, on your first watch, before you know what comes next. It's a lovely scene. But, um, well, well, what happens next? They're about to kill their maimed and injured, but they're charming. But they're Darwinian shitbags, but they're lovable. Except they're about to eat the sick like roadkill, probably. But, but they're cute, guys. Things, things have become very weird. And they only get worse. Lenny Henry gives a warm, emotional, feelingly written scene remembering those of their community who have died. And that's, that's all quite lovely. Until, <laughs> fuck, I can't believe, until you realize that a lot of these people were, um, well, should we say euphemistically left behind? Meaning they didn't die suddenly. They weren't attacked. They weren't murdered by outside strangers. Lots of them probably could have been saved. They were just left behind on the road to fend for themselves and, and die off. Or, or, as we later learn in episode no, 5, is it? Maybe they were actually kneecapped by their neighbors. Just actual sabotage. And this, this makes this speech surreally dark. Because after each name and cause of death, there's a chorus of, we'll wait for you. Miles Bright Apple, stuck in the snows of the mountain pass. We wait for you. Um, as I said on EFAP, this is posthumous trolling. 
because you didn't wait for them. That's why they're dead, you selfish little cunts. Yeah. Hell, uh, my prediction, I have to, oh yeah, oh no, that's embarrassing. My prediction in the last video was that the injury to Brandy's father would prevent their migration and lead to them staying longer in the camp. The camp would then be beset by an evil of some sort, her community would be massacred, and that would force Brandy, Steve, and probably Podge out onto the road together, her carrying a burden of guilt at this chain of events having been caused by the very adventurousness she once desired but now has no choice but to indulge in. It might have been a little bit formulaic, a little bit obvious, but I think that's a serviceable device. That's what I was expecting them to do. But every time I expect the writers to do something obvious but competent, well, they surprise me. They surprise me. I never anticipated that they would go off my grating and just leave behind their wounded like fucking savages. Hell, Ada, the big bad guy this show is teasing, is about to show more remorse for a dying orc than the not hobbits show for their close neighbors and kin. <laughs> oh no. Oh, what have you done to these people? Meanwhile, Steve examines the page from the Starbuck Brandy got him and accidentally sets it on fire because, um, because fuck it, I guess. I mean, something had to happen. This is something. Therefore, this had to happen. He panics. He knocks stuff over. He causes a panic. Rather than run away, though, or butcher him like the awkward, brutal little savages they apparently are now for some reason, the not-hobbits just kind of hide. But then Steve has learned Brandy's name now. Good job someone has, because I'm fucked if I remember her real name. And this prompts them to come out of hiding, though it also gets her in trouble. The group interrogates Brandy, and this is another opportunity for, you guessed it, the same fucking argument. Will you please fucking stop? They propose to kick it out, but Lenny Henry says, nah, their caravan can come, but it has to be at the back of the line. And this is bad, of course, because it means they'll be left behind. It's the father's fears manifest. Though I'm still unsure of the logistics of overtaking or the morality of overtaking. If they're allowed to be overtaken, they can still end up at the back and get left behind anyway. And then there's another problem, because if they already know where they're going, what's to stop them just arriving later than everyone else? And you'll recall, I'm sure, that the song earlier said that nobody walks alone. Unless they do, apparently. They're obviously going to leave them behind. What's even the point of singing that song if you're just going to abandon your kinsfolk anyway? It's a lie. It's a big, fat lie, you little fucking liars. And for this to seem anything other than jarring as hell, the show really needs to do more work to expand on this point. It will, and oh no, I regret saying that, because it will do more work later. It just makes everything worse. Subtle hints of barbarity, though. You could have thrown those in earlier. At least it wouldn't have come as such a shock. If you unfailingly portray the Not Hobbits as close-knit, lovable, communitarian bobbleheads, but then suddenly have that assumption exploded by revealing that they are probably cannibalistic, little murderous psychopaths, the viewer is left doing all of the work on behalf of the writers in an attempt to justify it. And, hmm, can you work your way toward a justification? At all? I mean, if you're being incredibly charitable, and I mean incredibly charitable, you could say this is supposed to depict an earlier, more callous time, a less civilized dog-eat-dog -dog world, or hobbit-eat-hobbit -hobbit world. But again, that's viewer doing work on writer's behalf. That's being charitable toward writers who haven't earned the charity. If past experience is any guide, it's much more likely that they're just so boneheaded they didn't even spot what they were doing. The same old argument about Brandy being unnaturally bold and adventurous continues to play out, but this one at least has then a flavor of Steve. I now regret that choice of words. Brandy believes he's special, but no one agrees with her. Apparently, the laws determine that anybody who breaks them will be, uh, de-caravaned? But Lenny Henry shows them mercy and says Brandy's caravan can still come, but as aforementioned, it must be at the back of the line, which means the same damn thing, doesn't it? And then we have another, another argument, and it's exactly the same again. We are once more forced to ask, why does everyone in this show speak in the same tortured similes and metaphors? But the tallest milkweed gets snipped. Writing is just really, really, really hard. Back in Numenor, Ocean Man, Sailor Twink, and Generic Sister are having dinner together. Sailor Twink says he wants to defer and go back to their home in the western shores of Numenor for reasons not adequately explored and that will be forgotten by the next episode. 
Ocean Man, though, says there is nothing there. The past is dead. This, bear in mind, after he's just come back from a library where the past was actually really fucking useful indeed. <sighs> so, okay, well, being fair to the writers, they are pushing at some deeper, darker reason for all of this. But once again, the dialogue doesn't match up with prior events. This is why, at the beginning of the first video, I said that seemingly insignificant laziness in the small things is worth pointing out. It really is so often indicative of an approach that creates many more and many bigger problems later on. Then a messenger arrives and reminds us what sister's name is. But, I mean, fuck if I'm going to remember. There are too many of these barely relevant NPCs to begin with. I have a nasty feeling this one will be forced to be relevant the next time the show tries to ape Game of Thrones. Because in subsequent episodes, she's going to start flirting with Beardy Boy's son. I don't know his name either. And that's going to be unfailingly horrific to witness. The relationship between Ocean Man and Sailor Twink has some promise, some potential. Uh, not fucking romantically, no, it's not that like Game of Thrones, I hope. But they do actually seem to have a semblance of life, history, and it's a bit of a shame that we're not spending any more time with either of them to really flesh this stuff out, and that the show keeps trying to distract us from it with more stuff, as happens here with the revelation that Sister has been accepted into the Builders Guild. Um, will that be relevant later? I, I don't... I don't know. And I don't care. Mighty Morphid Power Elf, presumably still being hunted, because remember she broke out of jail. Anyway, she finds her way into prison, where Hunk is being kept. Though how she knew that's where he was, I don't know. And it turns out that she's found something else in the mystery box. Another thing from the library with the sigil of the King of the Southlands on it. The same sigil as that worn by Hunk. Meaning... <laughs> fucking hell. Comp uh, reading this out, reading this out, it doesn't make any more sense. Because he is wearing a symbol on a little, little brooch thing, and she found that off screen in the Library of Contrivance, that means that he is now the King of the Southlands. Undoubtedly, undeniably, Though that makes, that's how this show works. That's logical. That makes perfect sense. Uh, there's no, nothing to fault with that reasoning. Well, I mean, except that, of course, having just discovered the evil enemy plot is conveniently written down on a thousand year old piece of fabric, waiting for her to go and read all about it and realize the mortal peril all the world faces. She then stuck around for a bit, I guess, looking for another symbol that she just happened to remember seeing him wearing when they were on the raft together and having that that argument. I, I, I kind of think I have to restate this just to take it in. She goes, she goes to a library. The library has the one thing to decode the Mordor symbol and the map she needs for that. It has a message from Evil Guy and that message tells her what the evil plan is and how much trouble the world is in, but she doesn't rush back. She stays in the library. She reads a few more books. She looks for the symbol, maybe, or she just finds it by chance. I don't know, because it's off screen. The symbol matches the one that Halbrand Sauron Hunk is wearing. That makes him the king of the Southlands. Because he's wearing a brooch that he could have just picked up from anywhere, and that he tells her he lifted from a dead man, but... She doesn't believe him, so so nah. I just, f fuck it, I don't get Whatever. This show has this perennial problem with a flow of information. Are we actually meant to remember the Builder's Guild stuff from earlier? Do you even remember the Builder's Guild stuff from earlier? You know, I mentioned it like two scenes ago, but so much has happened in the five minutes in screen time. There's a lapse since then. The stuff with his sister, you know, the, the whole, she joined the Builder's Guild, she's flirting with Chancellor's son thing. If that's important... Why put it right before this much more important revelation about the supposed royal lineage of Hunk? If you place secondary information for ancillary characters right before huge main plot relevant information dumps, there is a good chance the audience will overlook or forget about the former entirely. And this is doubly unforgivable since the show really doesn't fill its time that well. There are long stretches where nothing happens. More competent writers would have shifted events around in the timeline, so to speak, allowing for a more even spread, a more constant flow of relevant information, secondary characters being built up without being overshadowed by the main plot and its protagonists. You could even have placed the Builder's Guild information right back towards Sister Girl's first introduction to us. She arrives on the beach to meet with Sailor Twink, 
They have a short conversation on the way back in which this information is dropped. Nothing else of note is happening around that scene anyway. Comparisons with Game of Thrones are again invited because Game of Thrones, at least through its first four seasons, was very good at spreading this stuff out amongst its large and growing cast. But perhaps a more pertinent comparison would be from the Two Towers. Do you remember the kids that you see very early on as Saruman is speaking to Sauron about how he will attack Rohan? And we get a flash away to a village where a mother is shepherding her children away onto horseback and sending them off to Edoras to escape the oncoming army of Dunland. These kids recur, I believe, four times across the entire film. Their scenes, I don't think a single one of those scenes lasts longer than 30 seconds. You see them escaping. You see them arrive at Edoras, which is how they become aware that the villagers are being ransacked. You also know in that scene, from one line of dialogue from the little girl, that their mother has not joined them there. You then see them again when they arrive at Helm's Deep, where they are reunited with their mother. And then finally, I believe you see them once more when all the men and boys are called away to man the walls against Saruman's armies. Four short scenes, I don't think they take up in total more than three or four minutes of screen time. It's actually a little subplot in its own right, and it perfectly builds up the stakes for that battle scene. Because you've got a family torn apart, you've got the joy of them being reunited, and then you have the sudden tragic realisation that this boy we've seen, who has been so brave so far, is likely going to die because he's being torn away from his mother again in a bid to save his mother and sister. He's being conscripted. Incredibly efficient. Really fills out the world, makes it seem like there is always something going on. It's placed at a proper distance between important scenes that the full weight of it takes place, so we at least notice it. It's not bundled in two seconds before the next big fight scene. It's a way of conveying the profound emotion, the way the world feels about the events taking place within it. Brilliant example of writing. That is the direct antithesis to the approach to writing taken by Rings of Power, where there is nothing for vast oceans of time, and then just random pieces of maybe relevant information thrown in so soon before a major plot relevant piece of information that it might as well not have been thrown in at all because no one's going to pay any attention to it. That gripe dispensed with, we learn that Hunk does not want to be king. There is some hint of backstory given about the war with Morgoth, which Mighty Morphid Power Elf seems to say that the Noldor, that's Feanor's house, started. Hunk points out that his people sided with Morgoth, and this leads Mighty Morphid Power Elf to suggest that they can redeem both of their bloodlines. But again, this makes no damn sense without the kinslaying and the flight of the Noldor and the banishment that we overlooked from episode 1. It's not there. If that stuff still exists in Rings of Power's world, which will probably be retroactively explained if it does, everything else has been, then she couldn't have been sent back to Valinor in episode 1, because they were banned from going back because of the kinslaying. And so she couldn't have ended up here. For those of you joining this series in this video, if you haven't seen part 1 yet, the explanation of it is there. But the short form version is, when in episode 1, we learn that Morgoth destroys the trees, the elves take up their swords to go to Middle-earth to fight against Morgoth. That's what episode 1 tells us. In the actual event, Ungoliant destroys the trees, Ungoliant is the mother of Shelob, at the behest of Morgoth. Morgoth steals the Silmarils, which have been invented by Feanor, and he kills Feanor's father. Feanor wants revenge, the Valar tell him not to go. He tries to leave anyway, his fellow elves, the Teleri elves, refuse to let them use their ships, so the Noldor massacre the Teleri elves is the first kinslaying, and they leave on those ships. For this, they are banned from returning to Valinor. It is the ban of the Noldor. If this show is saying or suggesting that there is a kinslaying, which it seems to be, given Mighty Morphid Power Elf is talking about redeeming both bloodlines, then she can't have been going back to Valinor, so she can't have jumped off the ship, so she can't have arrived in Numenor, so she can't be standing here, so none of this could have happened. We learn that Mighty Morphid Power Elf's grand plan, part of it anyway, is to elevate Hunk as king and persuade the people of the Southlands to rise up against Sauron. She says theirs was no chance meeting, or fate or destiny, it was the work of something greater. Greater is not the word I'd have chosen for this writing team, but it sure as hell wasn't fate or destiny, it was desperation and the needs of bad writing. Back at the palace, we find Queenie saying portentous things to her father. Apparently, the moment they feared is here. The elf has arrived. There is a prophecy, apparently. So we're now further compounding the problem of backloaded information. Within the last, what, five minutes, we've had supposed character development for Ocean Man, Sailor Twink, and Generic Sister. 
but that was quickly overshadowed by the mystery box revelation that Hunt is maybe a king, and that he and Mighty Morphid Power Elf will join forces to raise a rebellion in the Southlands, which is at least competing for our attention with the new knowledge that there is some mysterious prophecy in Numenor, as Queenie relates it to us, though she is talking to a fucking vegetable because her king is paralytic, and this dialogue is really only meant for the audience's benefit. And then, back with the Not Hobbits, Brandy's family caravan does indeed fall behind because Dad can't walk, though Podge is Brandy's friend so she stays behind with them. One thing to note here, Podge has no parents with her. She is the only one on her cart, which means that her parents are some of those, um, left behind? Which means in the scene where they're giving the speech memorializing their dad, she is going along with Lenny Henry taking the piss out of parents that were probably killed and eaten by the Harfoots, she was probably forced to eat her own mother. Lends a really different tone to that scene, eh? Anyway, they're struggling, but then Steve... Well, was he in the caravan? It really looks like he's climbing out of the caravan here, and that makes it that much harder to carry. But the alternative, I guess, is that it's just bad film editing, and he was just hiding behind it the whole way. But anyway, he emerges from behind, and he fixes it for them, and he says, friend. Um, well, how he's learning these words... I have no idea, it's not as though anyone's spending any time teaching him. Steve incidentally appears to have abs, in case anyone ever had a weird fantasy about a ripped Gandalf. If you did, you're strange, but it will make do, this is the best you're gonna get. Though it does make you wonder why they didn't even try and enlist his help back at the start. Why did they not ask him to carry the caravan for them? And then, back with the orcs, it all gets a little bit Matrix. As the elves rebel against the slavers, who are vampires in this show when it's convenient for the show to have them as vampires, this time they do fry in the sun. One elf gets free, but he gets an axe in the back as he jumps up the tree roots. The fight progresses. There is a full comprehensive, and if I may say so myself, rather entertaining breakdown of this over at EFAP. It's a long one. If you want the full thing, the link is in the description. My short form version of it follows. Don Lemon does a ridiculous fucking move and knocks the orc's tent down, except not really, he knocks part of it down, but it doesn't seem to have any effect at all on the course of the fight, partly because the show is once again capricious with its orcs and their sunburn, so I guess the move was just there to look cool? And I've heard a few people, principally in response to Mighty Morphid Power Elves' takedown of the troll in episode 1, point to Legolas taking down the Moomakill or surfing on an Urukai shield as though this means any elf, for any reason, can do anything they like because it looks cool. This is a silly argument. As it happens, I am not overly fond of the Moomakill scene, but its point is to serve as multiple payoffs. Legolas is a muted character throughout the three films. He has few lines, he is not especially expressive, he has few opportunities to really show himself, and he is given few moments to shine in conversation or in interaction. So, sparingly, Jackson gave him these wow moments, part of the point of which is to be funny because of the contrast. If Legolas went around doing that kind of thing in every fight scene, it would have seemed implausible, it would have seemed objectionable, it would have removed all sense of threat and menace from any battle he is involved with. The Lord of the Rings trilogy put in a lot of time and effort to earn him two moments of what you might call pure badassery, which in both cases is supposed to lighten the mood a little bit from what might otherwise have been an oppressively bleak and intense battle. These are moments of character idolization that work by contrast with his normal restraint and narrative breaks that interrupt severity to stop it from becoming monotony, meaning that they are narrative payoffs as well. And then, of course, in the Moomikill sequence, it serves as the payoff to one of the trilogy's few and longest-running jokes, the kill count competition between Legolas and Gimli. Personally, I find the Moomer kill a little bit cringe, sure, but it isn't thoughtless. It serves a number of purposes, and in some cases as payoff for long-running setups, if you have any elf, any random elf, do implausibly brilliant things whenever the plot needs it to happen, or because the directors are talentless and want people to be superficially impressed by the spectacle, you are doing something very different. That is thoughtless, not thoughtful. It is laziness, it is not earned reward. That has potential impacts on the plot going forward, because we're left to ask, in any seemingly perilous scene, any of these elves is involved with. Well, why should we really bother investing in it? And why should we feel any kind of tension when we know they can just invoke bullet time and awesome their way out of whatever corner they've been backed into? 
Because this is all just lazy and intended to make us superficially impressed by a protagonist who still has no character to speak of after three hours of episode, it accomplishes nothing in the fight scene itself. The orcs unleash an absolutely horrific CGI warg that looks like a pug with some kind of syndrome. And by horrific, I don't mean the in-universe, this is a horrifying creature I'm faced with kind of sense, I mean out-universe. It looks unbelievably shit. It looks cheap, which isn't something you'd expect to say of a show with this budget. Its movement is terrible, at times it almost looks stop-motion. Compare it with the two towers wags, 20 years old now. It's staggering that they should have got this so badly wrong. I know Rags likes them, but he has strange taste in dogs. Don Lemon snags the pug in some chains and does another Matrix leap, stabbing the orc leader in the neck. Stick! The almighty, the glorious, the wonderful Stick! And allowing the warden we barely remember to escape. He climbs out of the pit, the warg goes after him, but Don Lemon saves him with a spear. Uh, is this, was this, was this actually stop motion? Can you do mocap on stop motion? Its movements are so jaggedy and, and weird and uncanny. Everybody involved in this should be fed to some actual wilds from 2002. Everybody's favorite newly demoted CNN anchor goes to climb up after him, but he finds that the warden has been shot in the lower mid abdomen with an arrow that I, well, again, another argument about this on EFAP, I insist this would not have killed him. No way. I mean, the shock might have stopped him, right? But hell, Boromir kept going with four of the things in him. Don, though, who, remember, has just used Matrix powers to do incredible jumps, cannot make the jump we just saw the Warden make. I do love me some superpower consistency. Now, you might think even if he did get up, he'd just have been shot, but oh no, no indeed. Just wait until you see what the next episode has in store. Either the orcs are selectively terrible shots, or Don Lemon has plot armor so thick it actually bends the air around him, and we get to see him actually catch an arrow in mid-flight. So he'd have been fine if the show had let him get up the top of the trench, but it can't do that yet because we need our cliffhanger ending. So he gets grabbed and pulled down and bought before... Well, okay, the show wants us to suspect that this guy, Adar, is Sauron. Well, for reasons that previously explained, I'm still pretty sure that this is a deflection, Hunk is still my bet for Sauron, I'd put pretty good odds on it. Then again, hell, I was wrong with my prediction about the not hobbits, because it turns out that what I consider to be the bare minimum level of competence for the writers to meet is in fact far above their collective abilities 90% of the time. But this brings us to the end of episode 3. Now I think I've taken up quite enough of your time already, so I don't propose any lengthy peroration, though I will take this opportunity to issue a warning. On EFAP, we were asked to rank the episodes from worst to best, and I'm pretty sure the conclusion went something like 8675432.1, which means I've already covered the best this show has to offer, and it's only going to get worse from here. I'll be taking a short break from the series to recharge, this video has been one long nightmare to make, and I'll be moving on to cover Black Panther 2 Bacandon Boogaloo before I return to Rings of Power. Theoretically, because I am now a full-time YouTuber, subsequent installments will not take quite so long to put together, but I am not setting a deadline because setting deadlines is an invitation to miss deadlines. My goal is to finish this critique series before Mauler gets done with Game of Thrones. I do have a couple of announcements before we close. As mentioned, and if you're a regular watcher you'll have heard all of this already, I have just become a full-time internet person. If you'd like to support my work here, there is a Patreon link in the description, as well as the usual super chat and super thanks options, and channel memberships are now open, giving you access to custom emojis and such. These are primarily a means of donating, I'm still mulling over suitable rewards packages. I do a monthly patron shout out, and that'll round off this video. The Little Platoon is also expanding. I have a second channel, and I am currently planning to turn that over to shorter reviews, response videos, and bits of music. My colleague, who runs our Substack, has just launched his channel as well, which is worth checking out if you like posh English reactionaries talking culture, politics, and religion. Links for all of this are in the description. We also plan on relaunching our weekly current affairs show on a new channel, and there will be news on that when I have it. Finally, as mentioned at the top, the response to the call to arms I issued in the previous video, an encouragement to create and to share with other creators, has been literally overwhelming, hence the fact I'm still working on replying to everyone who has messaged me on the back of it. As I half suspected, there are plenty of you out there with brilliant ideas 
and immense creative potential. Sadly, there are too many of you out there with all of that for me to review everything that's been sent. I'd need about five parallel lifetimes to get through it all. But that potential absolutely should be tapped. And so, the plan at the moment is to create a Discord server and then later on a website where we can all gather together, share scripts, stories, artwork, and ideas for the same, offer feedback and criticism, collaborate, and generally start building our own crowdsourced mythos to replace that which we've lost to the barbarian morons in Hollywood and the artistic establishment. The website will take longer to put together, but I hope to have the Discord server up and running in the next few weeks. Some of you have kindly offered your services already. I still have no idea what I'm doing. If anyone else wants to lend a hand setting it up and modding it, please get in touch with me on Twitter. Link for that is in the description as well. All that remains for this video is the monthly Patreon shoutout, so my heartfelt gratitude goes to. And here is the moment where I butcher your names. Silver Kerr, David Murphy, Disembodied Lego Head, Metal Jazz Disco, Greg Kleitsch, Instinct, Cole Bowman, A Shiny Sword, Ethan Zirkel, Ocella, Drag Drag Dragljub Kirkich, I think, Wolfbane, Juna Hautamaki, Kim Nexus, Slidebelts.com, Tito Obisi, JK, Zach Connell, Trevor, Jerry French, Daniel Zahn, MLP, Keith Holmes Jr., Thomas Adams, Ricardo Rakis, Gabalduck, Tristan Richardson, Stephen Diaz, Rain Steinberg, Inverse Flip, PTD2012, Werner Beitel, ATS67, Paul F. Dennis, Michael Enkvist, Nick Shandy, Joshua Rosenblum, Ghost Pants, Joe Schumacher, Panic Chicken, Curious Borg, Todd Stone, Mexolius, Flopmeister, Zachary Daniel, Ronald Matar, Stephen Ralph, Greg Kane, Tobias Lenkholz, Basso, Matthew Coates, Aaron, Hugo's Desk, Nate Mallory, Benedict Schneider, Alex, Sean Ledden, T. Grimm, now random supernatural, quote, random character, Sammy Q. Darkstream's music, S. Tony, yep, Brandon Casanelli, John Cole, and Jenny. Thank you all, and I'll see you in the next video.